Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, we're good. Yeah. yeah. I'm very well. Thanks for asking. How are you doing? We're all doing great, man. We're, we're all really happy to have you on the space. Yeah, I'm super excited to be here. Hell yeah. We're just, we're just waiting for a few more folks to, to jump on. Yeah, no rush. Take your time. Absolutely. How's your secret in my own? Sorry, what was that? I said, how's your secret in my own? It's good, thank you for asking. Hey, the faith. We're super excited to have you guys. Uh, me too. Some I want to run by Mark and Nate. Uh, just give them more of a background of base space because I've joined semi recently. I didn't really help build it. I just kind of started joining and doing recording and stuff. And I've really <clears throat> noticed that it's not just a select group of people. Like there's groups of the age between uh, like 18. I've heard people up at the 50 to 60 speak in here. I've had federal government employees speak in here. I've had minimum wage employees speaking here like it's not just uh software devs it's not just crypto investors there's brand new people to crypto there's people who work in the space there's people who've never heard of it there's people who are multi-millionaires there's people who are probably liquidated the whole nine yards is in here so uh i i think you guys have like a huge uh a, a huge potential to really uh get what bank getting out uh to maybe some new people in here. 
to the crypto space. Amazing proposals, and then just like really 
kind of uh, like take the lead on our on our research and architecting with our founders. So, so kind of two two cool cool themes about his story. Wow, that's that's actually super interesting um, that you, that you guys are seeing a lot of like traditional scientists and things like that move into the space. Um, I wasn't I wasn't quite aware of that. Yeah, so like if you have a look at it, so Tokamak, for example, is um, a new uh, sort of general uh, liquidity solution. A tokamak is actually a, a super magnet that's used to contain plasmas in fusion reactors. So it, it, you know, it should come as no surprise that the, the founder of that project was a, a nuclear physicist before he was in crypto. Curve Finance as well. Um, the the gentleman that uh, generalized the um, the the flattening of the the hyperbola that allows for curve to achieve near one to one swaps. Um, I think he also comes from theoretical physics as well. Um, yeah, there's a, a, a huge amount of examples. You know, we don't have to, to go through them, but certainly physical science and people from physical science backgrounds are really well represented in DeFi right now. Mark, can I ask about that? Do you think that's because of the money or because people are realizing this is the future? Uh, I don't think it's either of those things. Um, I think that, you know, scientists are trained to uh, identify problems, study systems, and um, you know, create new novel solutions for things. I think more than anything, we're driven by um, being able to apply our skills, you know, in a creative sense. I think a lot of people get the wrong idea about scientists that it's a, um, you know, a, just a, a monotonous grind or, you know, you're constantly just writing F equals MA on a whiteboard or something. Um, but it's actually extremely uh, creative. You need to be an inventor in order to be successful in science. And I think that with DeFi, We've found this way to be extremely productive and um, have immediate impact. So usually in science, because it's so bureaucratized and there's a huge amount of red tape, the uh, amount of time and effort required to get from a good idea to having an impact on the world is actually really it's a really long time and it requires a ridiculous amount of money. So my background is in small molecules and a lot of the, the stuff that I've been working on over the years is, you know, was geared towards um, pharmaceutical sciences, so, you know, new therapeutics or, uh, you know, tracing agents, things like that. Um, and, you know, once you start inventing these things, um, it can be decades or sometimes many decades um, before it actually enters a human patient. And so I think that, it, you know, science can be extremely stifling at times. Um, there's also a huge lack of funding generally worldwide. Um, so that even if you have a good idea, no one really wants to support it. Whereas in crypto, it's like if you've got a good good idea, everyone wants to support you and, and see if it works and, and, and get behind it. So I think just in terms of the, um, you know, our agency as as creative people, crypto offers this amazing outlet to, um, you know, to, to have influence and, um, and you know, affect, uh, affect people's lives in a positive way. That's an extremely fascinating answer because my assumption is that the brain drain comes because it's so lucrative financially, right? But that makes entire sense that it's just the evolution speed is much faster, so it's much more fascinating on a scientific level as well. Exactly. You know, in science, you got to, in order to uh, have an effect, you need to publish papers, you need to apply for grants, you probably need to teach students, which is fine. I actually quite, um, I quite enjoy teaching. Um, but the process is extremely slow. And, you know, generally you're doing this either out of a, a major research institution or out of a university. And both of these have such enormous um, inertia that getting anything done can sometimes feel like getting blood from a stone. Um, it, it's just infuriating. I've seen so many good ideas get left behind just because some bureaucrat somewhere um, was too slow to do something or, um, you know, the, some uh, publisher decided that something wasn't good enough for their journal or, you know, it, it's an extremely politicized um, thing, science, and it's a shame because I think that if scientists were just allowed to sort of run rampant, the, the world would look really different. Ulterior motives and... and uh egos get in the way often absolutely it's also like the, the whole game is broken right in order to uh, be successful as a scientist now you basically need to be old white and a man <laughs> i mean it sounds you know i don't you know i, I don't know if there are any uh, 
you know, people in here that, that would think that that's uh, controversial or not, but it's just a simple truth. If you have a look at how, uh, how funding is awarded, it's usually based on success in your career 20 to 25 years ago. So any, um, any momentum that you've gathered over, you know, recent years is generally not as productive. Um, it's very, very difficult to make a name for yourself and you're always competing with people that have a built in advantage. And so the, um, the incentive to innovate in science is, is weak and it's getting weaker all the time. Well, let's expand upon that. Now, do you think the blockchain is a springboard for potential ideas and innovation in, in the realm of science? that could never lift off yeah absolutely yeah so i I think blockchain um or DeFi in general actually probably finance in general is much more meritocratic um you can very easily um you know the the outcome to what people are are doing in DeFi is um is easily auditable right You, you can very easily determine whether or not something is has been um you know a has been interesting or useful, um, and whether or not people are, are um, you know, uh, whether or not it, it's garnering any traction. Whereas in science, it's much more difficult to do because usually the things that people use to evaluate other scientists and themselves is things like citation metrics. And these are games to, to no end. And it's gotten to the point where it's, where it's mostly meaningless. Um, but it's con- it, it continues to be the, the yardstick by which all funding is awarded. So yeah, I, I think that the good thing about blockchain is that you can you can be successful even if no one knows who you are, right? Think about all of the really great projects out there that are entirely anonymous. In science, if you're trying to be anonymous, you know, it, you, good luck, right? No, no idea is good enough um, for you to escape from, um, you know. Uh, from the the weight of your reputation, and I, I think that that's you know that that's something that science has in common. I think with professional athletes, it's like it doesn't matter how good you can be or how good you're going to be now. People are always paying attention to what's happened to you the most recent, like most recently, in the sense that you know with a lot of football players, they're only as good as their last season. In science, you're only as good as your last publication, and so sometimes. A really good idea takes a long time to gestate, and in previous generations, that wasn't such a big deal. You could, you know, spend 20 or 30 years on a, on one thing, and um, and then finally bring it to fruition. Um, whereas now, um, you basically you need to have a good idea that's realizable in in six months, because if you're not churning out papers fast enough, no one really wants to talk to you anymore. It's a different game. Welcome to the evolution. Hey. Uh- Oh, sorry, Crafto, continue, because I'm kind of, I have a different topic. No, I was just saying welcome to the evolution. I mean, you know, everything from insurance to NFTs to, you know, real estate, all of it's spinning on its head. It's, it's all going to change. Agreed. I just wanted to hop hey. in for a minute. Sorry, Jimmy. Uh, just very briefly, I come from the background of gene therapy, and I work in the industry of gene therapy. And everything that Mark just said, is absolutely 100,000% correct. I I don't have a, a position in, in the space of DeFi or crypto, but I've been actively trying to teach myself coding and really grow in that space. And it's something that has drawn me to that regard because of that. Jimmy, before we switch again. topics, Mark, are you uh, in this transition of science moving towards blockchain and crypto? Where are, you, where are you on that timeline? Are you like a pioneer in that space? Are you tailing? Are you in the middle? Like, where are we in that transition? Like, where where is the scientific community in joining you? Yeah, I mean, I consider this to be one and the same. Um, you know, once you get to, um, once you get to a certain level in, in the physical sciences, um, you realize kind of all the stuff that you learned was really just learning how to learn. Um, I. I wish I had a more uh, elegant way of, of, of stating that, but you know, most of the research projects that I end up in um, aren't in any you know the, the information required or the, the knowledge required to um, be productive in in those um, in those projects. There aren't any textbooks on them, right? The, there is no class at university that teaches it. You basically just need to work out what it is you need to know about and then, you know, grow your erudition in those subjects and then start learning to apply them. So I'd say that, you know, what people should, 
you know, if there are, if there's anyone listening, you know, who might be a, you know, in finance or in, in blockchain or something, what you should see scientists as, in my view, is people that have an extremely generic skill set in analysis and, um, you know, in, in creative, um, you know, creative solution development, right? They're, they're inventors, um, but they're also very fast learners. Um, you know, I, I, most of my um, most of my undergraduate education, for example, was entirely organic chemistry. Um, but I've been in research projects and everything from you know material science to um, you know building uh, new sensors, um, even um, you know like quantum physics and and other things. You know, um, I, I've done a little bit on, on CRISPR um, and you know a lot of biotech related stuff that nothing in my background would have prepared me for, except that my background prepared me for being unprepared, I think. And so, you know, with regards to everyone else in science, the, the people that have managed to get over those hurdles of getting thrown into something so unfamiliar and that they're completely unprepared for, and then learning how to get, um, how to get proficient in that new field, these are the people that I think will, um, will excel in, in blockchain stuff especially because it changes so quickly, right? Can you imagine if you wanted to create a university course for blockchain now, what would you even put in it? By the time you finish writing the syllabus, it's already obsolete. You need people that are, are quick on their feet and are, you know, are, are good at reading and writing, honestly. A lot of what we do is um, reading what other people are doing, criticizing it, learning from it, and, um, and iterating on it. And I think that these are the generic skills that, that scientists are, are, are taught, to, um, taught to develop. A hundred percent. I I agree with you. Um, and I, Mark, thanks thanks so much for that perspective. And um, I think there's definitely a lot that's coming up in the blockchain space. And we're def I'm, I'm super 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 curious to learn more about uh, scientists and how they're getting involved in blockchain. But I do want to redirect the uh, conversation uh, back to Bancor. I mean, we have a lot of new listeners who are just getting into blockchain um, that tune into the space regularly. Um, can you guys kind of dive into like what the Bancor protocol is and like what the purpose of the DNT token for all of the, all the new listeners um, that are that are tuning in for people that don't even know what what Bancor is actually about? Nate, would you like to take this one? You got it, Mark. Okay, sure. Um, so, uh, so Nate, was that yes? You do want to take it, or do you want me to take it? <laughs> No, I want you to take it. It's okay, uh, sure. it's it's five a.m. here, so you got this one. Yeah, go ahead. Um, okay, so yeah, Bancor is a liquidity protocol. Um, it is. It was actually the one of the first um, automatic market makers. So, if there are new listeners who aren't familiar with DeFi, um, there are a couple of things we need to discuss about market making and and what an automatic market maker is to understand what what problem it solves. So let's say that you are, um, you know, you, you might want to buy some Tesla stock, for example. Um, you don't actually ever buy this stock directly from Tesla itself. There's going to be a broker or, or someone somewhere um, that is, you know, offering you a price on that Tesla stock. And then if you pay that price, they will deliver that stock to you. But then on the other side of that transaction, there's going to be someone else that's willing to sell Tesla um, at that price. And so in order to keep um, markets liquid, meaning that at any one time you can realize the value of, of the thing that you hold, there is a, a professional there called a market maker, and they basically control the, the flow of money between buyers and sellers. And the specific device that they use to do that is called an order book. And so an order book is basically um, a, a continuous auction where there are people that are constantly bidding up the, the price of the thing that they, that they want to purchase. And there are sellers who are constantly trying to bid down the, the price, but both of them want to get the, the best possible deal. And so market makers will often um, buy stock from sellers when no one wants to buy it, and they will sell stock to buyers when no one wants to sell it. Um, and that means that the, you know, the, the economy keeps, keeps chugging along as it should and the velocity of money remains high. Um, the problem with this is that you have to trust that market maker to do their job responsibly or that they don't necessarily have a nefarious intent. Um, of course, they want to make money out of it. So you're never going to get, um, the, the best deal that you could have if you did like a, an OTC deal or something with someone that wanted to sell to you directly. 
But there's there's kind of more problems than that. One is that market makers historically um, have been known have been known to manipulate market prices in certain directions in order to um, you know to achieve um, sort of financial goals. This is um, you know one of the oldest forms of black collar crime. And, you know, there's a huge amount of regulation surrounding it that, that tries to prevent these things happening. But, you know, let's be honest, you're never going to stop crime happening just by, by making it, um, you know, by regulating against it. Um, we also know that, that the penalties have never really stopped anyone from doing it. So, um, and okay, so there's that aspect to it. And I think cryptocurrency at its core is, is a protest against having uh, trusted middlemen or, you know, elite um, overseers that, that, um, determine how, pri- how, how money moves around and what the value of things is. Um, so there's a good reason to try and remove that market participant and let people deal directly with each other. The other problem is that in cryptocurrency, there are so many assets appearing all the time. And we sometimes call this the, the long tail, um, that market makers aren't necessarily interested in making a market for. And that's a big problem, right? If you've got a really, uh, really new project and it's got a, a token treasury and it's got a token distribution, you've got token holders, they still need to be able to realize the value of those tokens at any time. Otherwise, the whole thing becomes um, insolvent. So this is where automatic market makers came in. And so Bancor invented this concept um, in sort of 2016, I think 2017, that sort of period. And it developed, um, so the, the concept of an automatic market maker is basically that there is a, a smart contract that can constantly adjust the price of things based on buying and selling pressure. Um, and this is the now, um, you know, the commonly referred to uh, bonding curve. And it uses a, um, a hyperbolic function um, to determine the price of things. What, what I mean by that is that when you're selling one asset for another asset, the thing that you're selling should be kind of dropping down in price and the thing that you're buying should be rising in price. And so we have a, an algorithm that uh, is auditable and that everyone will agree um, what certain um, purchasing and, and selling um, will, uh, what effect those purchasing and selling will have on the, the, the price of the asset being traded. And the great thing about it is that because it's a smart contract, you've basically obviated the need to have a market maker there at all, um, which means it's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And um, you don't uh, you don't need anyone's permission to do it. There's no KYC. Um, there's no oversight from um, anyone who you would have to trust um, to maintain something's price. Um, and that makes the, the cryptocurrency world a lot simpler. And so this was a really big deal um, when uh, Bancor first announced it, or at least in my opinion it was. I think the first um, what we call token relay at the time was liquidity pools, or that, that vernacular changed um, when Uniswap was developed, um, was for BNT and I think Gnosis. Um, and then there were a few others after that. Uh, then uh, Uniswap, so okay, in order to power these token relays and these liquidity pools, you need a, a, a base unit of exchange, right? A thing to which all other things in the network are compared so that we can all agree on what the price of something is. In the world economy, this is usually the US dollar, right? If, if someone says, you know, this is, this thing costs 1000 rupees or this thing costs, you know, 1 trillion Republic dectaries, um, you, the first question that should go through your mind is, um, you know, what, what is that in, in U.S. dollars, right? Because that's the thing that I'm familiar with. BNT is trying to become the U.S. dollar of, of crypto, right? And in a way, it's already achieved that. Um, it's present in all of the pools and has a direct exchange rate that's auditable at any time by anyone um, who cares to observe it. And you can always uh, take a BNT and swap it for any of the assets on the network. And you can also swap any of the assets on the network for BNT. Um, but this is also interesting because it means that any asset on the network is directly swappable for any other asset on the network using BNT as the conduit. So it creates a, a liquidity, uh, an actual liquidity network, right? Where any asset can be exchanged for any asset using uh, BNT as the uh, kind of the, um, the, the settlement layer. Now, um, after Bancor version one was released, 
we started to realize that there is this this other market effect um, that we didn't really, or the bank world didn't really anticipate was coming. And we now call this market effect in permanent loss. Um, and it's basically, it's a, a kind of opportunity cost. Um, but it comes from the fact that as the prices of things deviate, the pool has no way of knowing what the price on the outside markets is anymore. Um, and so what this presents is an opportunity to other market participants, we call arbitrageurs, um, to buy certain assets at a discount in order to bring the pool back in equilibrium with the rest of the market and then sell the assets that they bought at a discount on the open market um, for a profit. And that's fine, right? They, they, there's nothing necessarily evil or, or malicious about doing this, but it does mean that being a liquidity provider, is um, it can cost you money or at least sometimes hodling your coins and not providing liquidity with them is more profitable than providing liquidity with them. Um, so this was the situation um, in Vancouver version one, and this was the inspiration behind Uniswap. And so what Uniswap did was that they ripped out the BNT token and they replaced it with Ethereum. Um, there's no uh, controversy in, in why this was done. Uh, Uniswap is a, an initiative of the Ethereum Foundation. And at the time, uh, so 2016, 2017 era, it was kind of slimy or it was seen as kind of slimy to have your own tokens. It was still believed that Ethereum, the Ethereum token, would be able to perform any and all financial functions on the Ethereum blockchain. And so having your own token for something was kind of unnecessary. We now know, of course, that that's not true, but that was the, the, uh, the partial inspiration for, for Uniswap to rip out BNT and replace it with Ethereum as the base asset. The other thing that Uniswap did was that they simplified our contracts a little bit and that managed to get the um, the gas cost to users quite significantly down. And um, during DeFi summer, uh, Uniswap, we all know, became uh, the most popular um, the most popular DAP on, on Ethereum. And, you know, all the more power to them. I, I think that Uniswap is, is, is a great product. So, you know, there's a lot of um, vitriol and animosity between our uh user cases, um, but actually I have a lot of uh, respect for, for Uniswap and, 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 and what they've achieved. Um, but there are some problems that Uniswap isn't even attempting to deal with, and that has created a, a market niche that, that Bancor is, in my opinion, completely annexed. And that is that this problem of impermanent loss that I was talking to uh, talking about before, where liquidity providers can lose money by providing liquidity, Bancor addresses this by creating a, um, an insurance schedule that says, okay, if you provide liquidity and you lose money, Bancor will reimburse you for all of your losses and you get to keep all of the fees that you earned while providing liquidity. So it means that if you're hodling a coin, um, there's literally no reason to not participate in Bancor, uh, save for maybe the gas cost of participation right now. Um, and we think that this is going to be in a really important development in the, in the continuity of DeFi. Um, especially because Uniswap has now moved towards creating products that return to sort of servicing the market makers that we were hoping to make obsolete. Uniswap v3 is a very active version of, of automatic market making. So I'm not sure that the automatic, uh, part is, is, um, is relevant anymore. Um, but it means that basically they want amateurs to uh to get out of liquidity provision and leave everything to the professionals i think that the, you know you might you might um speculate that uniswap v3 is kind of like the death rattle of the the market makers right it's the the, the final um the final run at the people that used to control the old world of finance trying to get back into uh back into blockchain and um, take some of the autonomy that the DeFi users have developed for themselves away from them. And uh, having said that, Uniswap v3 is a, is a really terrific product, um, and I think it will serve those market-making professionals extremely well. Um, but for the retail side, for the long tail side, um, for the you know the mom and dad investors in DeFi, for the the people that are you know not interested in in giving up their day job in order to become active participants. Um, Uniswap is, you know, is kind of throwing them under the bus. And what Bancor is, is hoping to achieve is to basically create an environment that is so risk-free and so easy to use and so profitable, 
um, that all of the people that Uniswap is leaving behind, um, that we capture that demographic. So in short, what Bancor did in its original implementation was create automatic market makers in order to, um, in order to make obsolete um, the, the market makers from traditional finance. And now um, we are doing that again, right? We have, a, we have created an impermanent loss solution that means that retail investors have nothing to be afraid of in providing liquidity. And uh, we are hoping to make, um, you know, to create a home for them while, uh, while Uniswap is driving them out. And so I think that that's kind of, I hope that that kind of captures the, the overall ethos um, and, you know, um, value proposition behind Bancor. But I'm, I'm happy to, um, to go over anything. It's kind of a huge project, so I'm not really sure um, what depth to cover it at. Yeah, no, no, yeah. That, that was very, hold on, Jimmy, that, that was very, very, very thorough. Um, Chase, do you want to uh, follow up with your, your next question? Yeah, uh, Mark, first off, I was going to say thank you for that great uh like ten thousand foot high level and even going to levels that you did uh, you actually hit on a lot of the questions i had uh if you wouldn't mind could you just also kind of like re-express like the importance of the coincidence of once and how that's like a philosophical role for bnt and then uh just for like an average user what does it look like to interact with the band for protocol and how do those like pull rewards work yeah, sure. So um, I'll do it backwards, partially because I didn't quite hear the first question. Um, so I'll, I'll ask you to remind me of that after after this one. Um, so yeah, interacting with the Bancor protocol is is pretty easy. It's essentially okay. I compare it to um, this this product that came out when I was a, when I was a teenager called a, a high interest online savings account. Right at, at the time, this was a pretty controversial idea. There was a um, a Dutch bank called ING Direct. Uh, or ING, I should say, um, that opened up a, a service in Australia where, you know, they had no branches. There, you know, there is no bank that you can go and talk to. Um, but they did say that, you know, you can open a high interest account with us and move money from your, um, from your traditional bank account into this online saving account. And it will just accrue interest at a much faster rate. And so people are like, this is weird. You know, how does this even work? Do I get a checkbook? Do I get a visa card? You know, what is this? But I did it, and it was exactly what the product said it was, right? You just move money into this bank account, and now it's generating interest at a much faster rate than what your other bank account was. That's kind of what Bancor is, right? If you have uh, cryptocurrency, you can either keep it in your MetaMask wallet, where it will, you know, it's still going to appreciate in value. I think that, you know, we, we all know where crypto is headed. Um, but during that time, it's not accumulating more tokens, right? The same way that if you have, uh, you know, cash under your bed, it's not accumulating more cash. Whereas if you put it in a, in a high interest account, it would be accumulating more dollars. Um, so that's kind of what bank, what it feels like to interact with, with Bancor as a liquidity provider. We support something called single asset exposure, which is dramatically different to um, some of the product offerings of our competitors, which means that you can, you don't have to hold BNT or own any BNT uh, or interact with BNT at all, actually. Uh, to become a liquidity provider on Bancor. You can just come up to the pool and say, I want to deposit, you know, 100 tokens of my favorite token. Um, and as long as it's supported on the network, the, the network will accept it and you will immediately start earning swap revenue on it. Um, and that uh, swap revenue is paid in the same token um, that you provided. So if you, if you provide ETH, you earn ETH. If you provide Chainlink, you earn Chainlink. Um, and this is because the people that are using the liquidity that you provided um, to, uh, you know, to facilitate the swaps that they're interested in, they have to pay you a small premium for that. And it's usually in the vicinity of about 0.2% of the trade. And that, um, that revenue accumulates in the pool and it is available for you to withdraw. Um, the liquidity mining rewards that you spoke about, this is um, a, a part of Bancor's growth policy. So this is an inflationary, um, an inflationary element to Bancor's monetary policy right now while it's in you know, um, a period of rapid growth um, that's helping to distribute the token uh, a little bit more thoroughly amongst the, the DeFi community. So those liquidity mining rewards are contingent on a, a DAO vote. Certain pools become incentivized with it. And they receive about 10,000 BNTs um, from the from the protocol 
uh, every week, and that's distributed amongst liquidity providers pro rata. Um, the, the of those ten thousand that are admitted per week, seven thousand of those are um, are distributed to the BNT side of the pool, but three thousand of them are distributed to the token side. And this means that the, the bank or supply is actually spreading itself out over a much larger user base. And this is actually really important. And, you know, I, I, I've got a feeling that uh, we're going to be talking about inflation later in the discussion. So I'll leave that, um, I'll leave that for, uh, for when that becomes relevant. Um, but just know that there, there is um, a really good sound economic reason for why a paying BNT to token liquidity providers has uh, potential benefits. So yeah, I hope that makes sense. That Bancor is basically just a high interest bank account, and as the protocol grows and matures, um, it will start to look even more like that, right? You, you won't even know that you are, um, you know, the the end goal should be that when users are uh, using the protocol, that it just looks like online banking, right? That it won't even they won't even know what blockchain they're using. Um, they won't have to know about gas costs or anything like that. It will all just happen in the background. So that's that's. Kind of what it looks like now, except you do need to know a little bit about, you know, Ethereum and, and how to use it. You know, you need to know about your hardware wallet and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but oh, that's something else I should point out is that Bancor is not a custodial service. Um, you can stake directly out of your ledger, for example, and, and continue to earn um, swap fees that way. So Mark, what was your first question? Um, I'm sorry, Mark, do you, do you have any pointers on when you do add liquidity over that 90-day period, are there final zones? that you should take note of when you reach that 2% mark or when you should add additional liquidity? Um, where, which points are more advantageous to, to your growth and, and interest that you gain? Yeah, so I, 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 can also, I can also take that. Yeah, the, the sort of experience on the front end when you land on Bancor.network is you're pretty much presented with all the tokens in the network. And you can see, let's say, there's a bunch of different columns and you can track the amount of uh, uh, APR you can earn from mining rewards and the amount of APR, well, historical APR you can earn from fees that are processed in the pool. So you're essentially looking at the pools that have the best APR if you're, say, a BNT holder because you can provide BNT to any pool on the network. And then if you're, say, you know, if you're providing ETH, or link to the link pool, um, or, you know, or stablecoin, or you know, any of the uh, tokens in, in the network, and that's just provided as single-sided liquidity. So you're just providing that token instead of providing the other side of the pool in BNT. You're just providing the token, and after you provide liquidity, you're essentially bounced to a portfolio page that shows you your positions in different pools over time, and it also shows you the amount of BNT rewards that you've earned. And unlike sort of other, you know, rewards programs and AMMs, where you're essentially rewarded the token, and then in order to put it back into the protocol, you have to pair it with another asset or you have to sell half of it. You can just restake your BNT rewards to compound your returns single-sided. So you can just put it uh, just BNT back into the pools, and that allows you to sort of generate even more uh you know revenue from from your assets and again you can get those bnt rewards whether you're providing bnt as a liquidity provider or whether you're providing the token side like link or eth Did that answer so, that, so that bnt when should i start to stake that in the course of the 90 days should i wait a 30-day mark today i mean it depends on the size of your. It depends on the, the the size of your stake. So you know, it's not um, it's not any secret that the the gas fees on Bancor are pretty high right now, and this is why I've, I've got to I'm immediately getting back to work on this spec sheet after this call. Um, but you know, th there is a um, there is a cost to restaking, and so you can crunch the numbers a little bit to work out what the optimum um, what the optimum uh, compounding rate should be for your rewards. Um, but let's say for a, for a second that there are, there's no gas fees on Bancor. In that case, uh, continuous restaking, right? Like every block, uh, is theoretically the most efficient way to to compound those rewards. Okay. Um, I think that's a perfect segue into the next uh, two questions. Unless Crafter, did you have something to reply to that? 
No, sir. Thank you. I appreciate it, gentlemen. Um, so, Mark and Nate, just for those people that haven't really used Bancor as much or don't know as much, uh, can you go in depth on what VBNT is and what the Vortex is from the uh, one-to-one ratio that you need to get your initial stake back and the uh, buyback and burning of VBNT? Yeah, for sure. Um, so, um, okay, so Bancor is, is run by a, a DAO. And your voting rights in the DAO are determined by your participation in the protocol. So if you provide 100 BNT, then the protocol issues you 100 VBNT. And you can use those VBNTs to stake in the governance contract and, you know, submit proposals and vote on proposals and, and, you know, help to, help to make the the protocol better and, and, and run it correctly. So if you're being issued voting rights when you're participating in the protocol, then you need to forfeit those voting rights when you leave it. And so what this means is if the um, if you deposited 100 BNT and you've got 100 VBNT in return, you then have to return all of that VBNT in order to unstake your initial BNT. Um, this is an interesting situation because the BNT that, um, that you originally staked can accrue in value over time, but the amount of VBNT required to unlock it never changes. So it's only ever um, determined by the initial stake value um, that, um, you know, that, that will determine the amount of VBNT required to unlock it. So this is an interesting situation because that means VBNT is like a key, right? It's not redeemable by anyone else but you for the BNT that it represents. Um, but you can still use it in a way um, to, uh, to access credit. Because let's say that um, your friend has a gold bar in a safe and he locks it in the safe and gives you the key. And there's no other key like it in the world. Um, and he hides the safe from you, so you can't use the key to unlock the gold. But you know that he's going to come back for this key one day. Because if he doesn't, he's effectively throwing away that gold. Um, the question is, can you use that, that key as collateral? On most, market, on most uh, liquidity protocols and uh, lending services, that's not the case because the, the value of the collateral is, um, is always determined at face value, right? And we, if you're uh, on the bank or protocol now, you can see that the price of BBNT is actually pretty low. But this is actually an artifact of the, um, the system that we've embedded. Okay, so let's um, let's go back to this, this safe and key idea, right? This gold in a safe, your friend wants that gold, um, and he's given you the only key. And he's asking you, will you lend him $100 against that key under this, the suspicion or under the, you know, the conviction that he will one day return for it? That's not such a bad bet. And... Um, if we can't use uh, if we can't use services like like Aave, for example, or Compound to to loan out that value, then then what can be done instead? So what we imagined um, was that if you take the bonding curve mechanics that we've already developed for um, that we've already developed for price discovery um, and liquidity between assets, what happens if you invert that right and turn it into a credit system? So the whole idea of when you pay interest against a loan, it's partially to incentivize the loan to be repaid, but it's also to disincentivize future loans from being taken out. Right? And so this is why you know the, the Federal Reserve, for example, will will adjust credit rates um, you know every few years because it needs to make sure that it's managing the, the debt of its economy. And in, at Bancor, we realize that we can automate that. Um, by putting VBNT and BNT together on a price curve and letting people swap their VBNT for BNT um, in order to extract value from it, that will drive the price of VBNT down and make it uh, less attractive to, to continue swapping it out. And so in a way, this automatically manages the, the incentive to enter into a debt position on Bancor. And it means that there's no interest on these loans and there's zero risk of liquidation. It is a perpetual loan, free of interest and free of liquidation. And it, it achieves everything that um, the interest rates and, um, and margin calls already achieve. So we've ended up in a situation that for, um, for liquidity providers, even though they're staked on bank four and they've got their BNT you know, locked up in the, in the protocol earning money for them, that if they ever wanted to access some of that money, Right? If they ever needed to make a partial withdrawal, in a sense, 
in order to participate in all the market activities or you know anything right you could even you could even use this mechanism because you know your um your girlfriend's birthday is coming up and you want to buy her something nice or that your car broke down and you want to you know you need to repair your car but you don't want to sell your bnt because you know who wants to sell their bnt <laughs> but you know what i mean right you, it gives you the the ability to access money when you need it and then uh, repay it later without um, without interest and without liquidation goals. So that's kind of the, the BNT, BNT mechanism. And, and essentially, you know, what you're doing, in, say you put BNT in the protocol, you get back VBNT, then you can swap it for any asset. So like Mark was saying, if there's a, you know, a farming opportunity on another protocol, you need ETH, you take your VBNT, swap it for ETH, participate in that farming opportunity and then when you want to uh get your bnt back from the pool and the fees it's accrued and the mining rewards you swap your eth back for vbnt and that's the key that you can pull your your funds out so the bet that you're making is that you can make more money doing whatever you want say with your eth or also you can provide that liquidity back on Vancor. you can do whatever you want but you're making more money then eventually what you'll have to buy back your BBNT with in order to unlock your BNT. And so if the B VBNT price is rising from where it is when you uh, when you swapped your VBNT, you know, that costs you more money to buy it back. And you, the bet you're making is that you can make more money than, than the cost and that it will be worth it taking out this leverage on your staked BNT. But we're really seeing a really high demand for people that want to effectively take leverage on their stake liquidity and not just hold it locked up in the pool when it's not, you know, doing anything. It's not as it, it's productive, but it can be more productive if you take leverage on it. Um, right. Yeah. Oh, okay. and then the, so and so then the the other question then is is how does the burner work? All right. And this is the the key component of the, the vortex because it's actually a deflationary mechanism of the protocol. So at the moment, um, we take about 5% of all swap revenue um, across all of the whitelisted pools. And that swap revenue accumulates in a wallet. And uh, anyone can actually trigger this wallet to, to perform a burn. And I'll explain what that is in just a minute. But you actually get rewarded for that, right? It's a, it's kind of like, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a gamified like, like everything else in DeFi. So what happens here is that the, the wallets are accumulating funds. And then uh, if you come and execute the wallet to, to perform its function, what it will do is it will trade those funds for VBNT, which drives the price of VBNT back up. And then it immediately burns those VBNTs. So why would we do this? Um, note that when, the, when borrowing pressure is really high, that's pushing the price of VBNT down. So when that swap is performed from the, the accumulated you know, um, network revenue for VBNT, it's buying that VBNT at a, at a low rate. And then as it destroys it, it's important to remember that each one of those VBNTs is required to unlock a, B, a BNT somewhere else on the network. So when we're burning VBNT, we're actually burning VNT, right? That is the... Um, that is the a, a really important concept to, to sort of uh, get comfortable with. As you burn the VBNT at a low rate, you're actually burning VNT at a high rate. So at, right now, I think this, the, the swap value for VBNT is something like 0.3 BNTs, which means for each dollar of VBNT that gets burned, we're actually burning $3 of BNT. And this helps to counteract some of the um, the other inflationary pressures that um, affect our supply. Although it's worth pointing out that this is a much longer term, um, you know, a much longer term mechanism for the DAO to exercise. Um, while things like liquidity mining rewards and things are are are, um, are active, or at least while the liquidity mining is as lucrative as it is right now, things like the the burner aren't a, a huge influence on um, on BNT's um, economics. But as the protocol matures and it becomes, you know, its own economy, um, and its own, you know, especially its own cross-chain economy, things like the BBNT burner are going to be, um, you know, it, it gives Bancor this way to make sure that its token supply is always managed in in the most healthy and productive and sustainable way. Okay, so basically, wow. long-term hold BNT. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Hold the NCAA. Yeah. yeah. Th- thank um, you guys for breaking down that uh, incredibly interesting mechanism. Um, that's fascinating to hear. I do want to give an opportunity. I know we have some guest speakers that have some questions. So, Jiminy, if you want to go ahead and ask a question and then followed up by Jimmy, if you want to do a question afterwards, um, I just want to make sure everyone has an opportunity to ask what they'd like. Yeah, I appreciate it. Happy to um, jump on. Appreciate it. you having so. Um, I'm really fascinated by you know the, the tokenomics and uh, BNT and uh, the multiple functionalities um, that it can serve within its own network and um, the value proposition. Um, and originally a chain link link marine myself um, found my way to BNT. It's essentially my my side bag right now. My my only other um, hold and. Um, you, I wanted to touch back onto something you mentioned with in permanent loss. Um, I had a question on how it could potentially tie to Chainlink, if, if you might be able to speak on it. Um, you mentioned how the protocol does not have the information from the outside network and potentially centralized exchanges for current price data when there's a fluctuation, and then it takes you know arbitrators to come on and you know buy back and sell to balance the price. Um, is it possible through the applications of Chainlink and their price feed data to potentially inform the protocol um, at some point uh, in the development of Banker to uh, essentially eliminate the need for the arbitration and reduce the impact of the impermanent loss? Yeah, absolutely. And so this um, this has actually already been done. So um, Bancor, so the reason why, uh, or part of the reason why I think the Bancor and the Chainlink communities are so well aligned is that Bancor took a huge gamble and um, actually built um, a first of its kind dex uh, powered essentially 100% by Chainlink. And this was um, what we call Bancor version 2. And it's interesting because what Bancor version 2 was, was actually an automated version of Uniswap v3. Um, so uh, depending on how um, you know, familiar everyone is with what Uniswap v3 is, is that it, it, it provides uh, what they call concentrated liquidity, but when Bancor invented it, we called it liquidity amplification, but it's the same idea. Um, we basically allowed the pools to be uh, to behave as if they're 20 times deeper than they actually are, which means that you get much better slippage. Um, and that, you know, that, that was a really good reason to trade on, on Bancor. Um, and instead of using the bin system that Uniswap v3 has, so there is a slight difference between our solutions, um, Bancor was using dynamic weights instead. Um, and those dynamic weights were completely under the influence of a chain link oracle. And so, yeah, we, we, we did this and, uh, chain link, the, you know, the product works exactly how it's advertised. The, the reason why Bancor version two failed wasn't because of a shortcoming of chain link. Um, but it's because of the adversarial nature of Ethereum. So what we found was, and this is what I think a lot of the automated solutions on, on Uniswap V3 are about to contend with is that any automated system is exploitable um, in, you know, if it relates to um, the, the passage of, of value um, at a future time. Let me explain what I mean by that. Um, if you are watching the bank or pools as an arbitrage or as even as an Ethereum miner, you can anticipate what the Oracle is about to do because you're watching the mempool Whereas the oracles are only ever watching um, the the price feeds, so even if the chainlink oracles were instantaneous and they're not, um, but they were pretty fast. But let's go ahead and say that they're infinitely fast. They can deliver price information to a dex within the same block that the price is changing. It's still not fast enough because the arbitrageurs and the miners know what the price will be ten blocks from now. And that's because they're watching the mempool and they get to decide which transactions get included. So they are manipulating the future price, whereas Chainlink is only ever watching what the current price is. And this led to a front running issue where people were deliberately exploiting the, um, the lag between what arbitrageurs know what's, know what's about to happen and what Chainlink only knows is, is currently happening. And that meant that there was, uh, we actually lost a lot of money doing this. The, um, the, it was very easy for, for arbitrageurs and front runners to, to move money out of the pools. And it, it basically, you know, it culminated in what we, what we expect is a, an unsolvable problem. But we've actually seen, you know, a lot of people didn't learn from us either, right? Dodo, um, also introduced an Oracle system, 
and their pools were getting drained um, as well. And I don't think they were using Chainlink though. I think they were using a they were using a, a weird combination of some other external Oracle plus an internal one. But the problem is the same. Once you once people are watching what the Oracle is doing, um, it's like playing chess against an opponent who tells you what their next move is going to be, uh, and that is a problem for DEXs. Um, but that doesn't mean that. We, yeah, go ahead. And can you also dive into? some of your future work without giving away the releases, but areas where we do see a value of having a price feed like Chainlink feed, uh, feed information into the pool. Yeah. And how that actually um, can lo- unlock some pretty amazing features. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, awesome. I'm under- I, I wonder, as, as a part of that, I'm sorry to interrupt, if fair sequencing services can serve any role to improve this from Chainlink yeah, that's coming. Yeah, possibly. I've been, you know, I've been meaning to get back in touch with Chainlink. Um, I've got a, you know, there, there have been a couple of other systems that I've been working on, um, that would require a chain link price feed. Um, some of them are, are very core to, to, uh, the bank or DEX functionality and in, not just in controlling and permanent loss, by the way, there are, there are lots of reasons why a price feed, um, is useful. One of the things that I'm struggling with right now is that it is very, very difficult to simulate um the effect of an oracle in um in continuous time so you know when you write a computer simulation usually it's kind of a step-based sort of system Um, but the problem is that if you have a look at trade volumes they tend to happen in you know it follows a sort of an exponential decay you get you know a, a very sharp rise with very large numbers of transactions happening in like very together and then over time the um the the transactions kind of spread out and this means that when we're trying to study how a uh, how a dex would respond to an oracle price feed for, for all kinds of products um it's very difficult to know beforehand how the you know how the ecosystem is going to try and exploit that oracle because you always have to assume that if something's exploitable someone's going to try and exploit it um and so, yeah, learning how to better simulate oracles is something that I have a deep interest in and I'm meaning to reach back out to Chainlink to, for some help with that. Um, but yeah, as Nate said, you know, we have a huge amount of Chainlink infrastructure from V2 and, you know, it, we do have plans to put it to use. Um, I, I'm under strict instructions to not reveal exactly what we, what we plan on, um, on bringing to the Becker ecosystem, which is a shame because I really just want to tell you what we, what we're doing and how Chainlink is involved. But just know that, um, having price feeds is, you know, well, not even price feeds, everything that Chainlink does and all of the information that it provides from the real world feeding into blockchains. If DeFi is going to become anything like traditional finance, Chainlink is going to be a core component of that. So, you know, I, I don't feel like, you know, it, it should it should come as no surprise to anyone on this call that whatever Bancor does, whatever Uniswap does, whatever Compound does, whatever Aave does, whatever anyone is doing in finance or in DeFi right now will eventually involve Chainlink. Um, I, I really don't see any way around it. Because as we become more world facing, right, it's it's easy right now to not use Chainlink because everything that we do is on chain. Eventually, that will no longer be true. Um, and if we're going to solve real-world problems, um, you know, the, you need some intermediary to feed information into these systems. And there, you know, there is no competition. It, it has to be Chainlink at this stage. There just is. There's just no one else. You just win. <laughs> just win. <laughs> um, Jimmy, hey, uh, go ahead and ask your question. And, and thank you, Mark, for going into that uh, super in depth. That's Really interesting. Thank you. That's great. Cool. Hey, uh, thank you, Mark and Nate, for coming and spending some time with us. I appreciate uh, taking the time. Uh, I just have one question. Um, so I'm impressed by your guys' innovation uh, over the competition you guys have. But would you agree that for your company, it's a race between getting liquidity providers and pumping up the volume uh, and versus inflating the token because of liquidity prevention? Um, you guys have, because you guys, uh, you know, I saw in your guys' economic report, you're trying to get as much liquidity pooled, and that's why you guys are doing the, you know, the BNT holders are kind of at risk. Would you say that, that, that that's the race that's happening here? Yeah, I mean, there's, um, there's a lot to sort of tease apart here. 
So let's let's go back to <clears throat> let's go back to um, the underlying assumption that we had when we first launched liquidity mining. We expected um, that things like market aggregators, like like one inch, would eventually become really popular with traders because it's the best way to get the best prices. Now, depending on how much you've been following what's happening with market aggregators right now, uh, it turns out that that's not always true. But for, forget that for a moment. Let's say that market aggregators are good enough that there's no reason to ever trade directly on index. Then the um, the best way to to be the best dex is to um, to create the best possible environment for liquidity providers and you know by giving them things like impermanent loss insurance and single single token staking and then you know liquidity mining on top was just to kind of get the ball rolling bring in as much liquidity as possible and so the yeah the hypothesis was if you have the deepest pools you will get the most traffic we now know that's not true and it's it's not clear why um, we've been spending a huge amount of time investigating why traders leave so much money on the table. Um, I've seen some really weird shit on Uniswap, right? People performing, you know, uh, people paying $20 in gas in order to trade $12 of tokens. Um, I'm not, you know, take that for what you will. It could be just like a, a newbie or something, not sure what's going on, or just trying out Uniswap for the first time or something. But we also know that there's other things on Uniswap. Uh, with regards to um, like front running and um, and other weird kind of market behaviors that are exclusive to Uniswap. Um, so, for example, I, I recently saw uh, an Ethereum block that was full of empty transactions, except for one, uh, except for two. Sorry, one being uh, a Uniswap trade, and then the other one being someone front running that trade. Um, that doesn't happen on Bancor. I don't know why it doesn't, um, but it seems like there's a huge amount of attention from these, you know, these market antagonists on exploiting traders on, on Uniswap, and that actually drives the volume up. But it doesn't mean that, um, that necessarily liquidity providers or traders are getting the best experience. It just means that the people exploiting that system are uh, are making money out of um, people's naivety. Uh, in terms of, you know. So that that was the that was the assumption. We grow the pools really really deep. We'll bring traders. Yeah, go ahead. Man. And and I and I also just want to get to the the heart of that question, which I think sheds light on a, a really common misconception about our model. Well, you know, all of a sudden, liquidity providers are not exposed to impermanent loss anymore, and people their knee jerk reaction is, oh well, Bancor is just paying out BNT to cover their impermanent loss. And the piece that's sort of missed in the equation is actually what Bancor has done is allowed the protocol to co-invest its BNT. So when someone comes with, say, a 100K link and the link pool has uh, co-investment available, then a BNT will mint 100K uh, BNT into the other side. And it generates fees off of those co-investments that can then pay out uh, 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 IL protection. So can can compensate uh, the link provider if they suffer IL. And so we've really transferred the uh, risk onto the protocol, but also the rewards that the protocol can then use to cover this impermanent loss. And so it was really encouraging, I'd say three or four months after we launched it, to see that the amount paid out for IL compensation is super low. I think right now it's less than 2% of the BNT total supply. And the protocol is using this buffer of fees to compensate uh, LPs. And it's a very small cost to to the protocol now. Um, and and so that that is the sort of confusing point for a lot of people is they think, oh, well, they're just going to inflate their token into infinity, paying out a permanent loss insurance. But the main driver now of inflation is liquidity mining rewards, um, and uh, we, yeah. but and the, that's not really my point though. Because the thing is, okay. in your own economic analysis, uh, toward the end, it says that the risk is being placed on the BNT holders of the token right. because the, the the loss prevention is going like you're using that as an incentive to attract liquidity. And so then the risk is going on to the BNT holder and the BNT supply has inflated a significant amount. So I just would, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so, so yeah, I think, so it's important to realize, so 
if we talk about that risk and what has been realized, so that risk is you, you should remember that that risk of you know being reflected onto the BNT holders, that's the same risk that the Etherisk community is going to face with DIP. It's the same risk that NXM faces with NXM. So that Nexus Mutual faces with NXM. Bancor is not just a DEX. It's a DEX and an insurance company. And that insurance right now is specific to, uh, to liquidity provision. Um, now, so as with any insurance um, economics analysis, what you're looking at is, is the, uh, is the total, uh, is the total profits out, or is the total, you know, gains out of that system um, higher or lower than the total liabilities? And, you know, partially due to the fact that BNT went 20x and, and outperformed a bunch of the, um, outperformed a bunch of the assets on its network it's currently about two percent uh it, you know it's unable to um it, it, there is a, a slight imbalance um equal to about two percent so that's a, a you know the equivalent of something like state farm saying that you know they made you know two percent losses this year but insurance is generally very very profitable um, and, you know, we have the ability to, to adjust and dial in the, the effective insurance premiums paid, the liquidity providers to, to remain before they get insured. Um, and so when, when that, um, you know, it is very easy for us to calculate, you know, how much extra time liquidity providers should need to stay in order for the protocol to break even. And it's important to realize too, we could target deflation with uh, with this same insurance mechanism, which is you know a profound realization to have. The the same thing that you know people are are criticizing us for with regards to you know protecting liquidity providers, um, saying that that's going to just inflate the supply. Um, that that could actually also be used to deflate the supply. It's just that right now, um, you know, we're still kind of experimenting and, and working out what these specific parameters are. Um, but, it, you know, it, it's not difficult to, to move it back onto um, a deflationary or, or break-even model if, if, um, if we needed it. It's just that the uh, the cost of insurance provision right now is so low. It's like, as Nate said, even with the 100 days, which is kind of just a ballpark guess with the economics paper, that's proving to be mostly true. At any one time, the, the cost of providing insurance to the liquidity providers across the protocol is effectively zero. Um, so, we, you know, it's, we don't mind doing it. Um, and so, and so while when you it, think about that, when you think about that inflation, you break it out. It's the inflation that you've seen, and, and you call attention to our increasing inflation, is two things. Like I said, it's liquidity mining rewards, which are pure inflationary. As we uh, put these rewards out in the system, they become the property of the LPs. And then it's also the protocol that is minting BNT into these pools to co-invest, and that's BNT that will ultimately be burnt. So when you see this inflating supply, you have to remember that a large share of that BNT that's out there is also inevitably going to be burnt. So correct me if I'm wrong, it's much like a mortgage pool, correct? Yeah, it's very, very close. That's actually a really good analog. Uh, just to be clear then, the, the uh, burning, the tokens that are going to be burned, those are counted in the current supply now? Yeah, they are. So we're actually, we, we have a, if you check our most recent progress report, um, we now have a script that allows the, um, the, the protocol, you know, the, the tokens that are effectively not part of the circulating supply, um, to be removed from that, uh, from that estimate where, you know, we're reaching out to CoinGecko and other places to try and get the, the circulating supply metric, uh, rebalanced. Um, but once you take that into consideration, that the, the supply drops by like a little over fifty percent. So the uh, the inflation of per, per BNT has been massively overestimated. Um, but let's say let's even say that it wasn't right. Let's say that it really was inflating that much. Um, that's still less inflation than um, Bitcoin um, than Bitcoin had during its launch, right? So if you have a look at Bitcoin up to twenty eighteen, it went from zero to eighty percent of its supply, um, and that was also the most uh, productive period for Bitcoin. You know, the, the, it's weird in crypto how how inflation and deflation are, are measured because everyone has this you know this fear of how inflation is affecting other economies around the world when you know it comes to, to dollars. Um, but actually, deflation is just as scary. So you know, one of the examples I would like to to draw attention to is something like Doge, where um, 
you know, we, we, we've all watched in awe as, as the Doge uh, price has completely skyrocketed. Um, but its distribution is so bad that we already know that it's due for, for failure. So um, I think that the top, you know, 103 wallets, around about some, sorry, about maybe 104 wallets, um, control about 94, 95% of the, of the Doge supply. And so this is, you know, you, you're always trusting that the people that hold these huge collections of Doge are, are never going to turn around and try and dump it all um, because that's going to completely decimate the, the Doge economy. Um, but Bancor, the, the protocol itself is the largest Bancor whale. Right. All of these VNTs that get minted and owned by the protocol to support single-sided token deposits, these are VNTs that can only ever be bought from the pools, but the protocol will never dump them. And as long as the protocol is the, the largest VNT whale, then the distribution of VNT is something that is actually extremely positive. When we pay out VNT to, to people in, in liquidity mining rewards, especially on the token side, and when we pay out VNT for impermanent loss insurance, this means that the BNT supply is becoming more and more distributed. And that actually creates a much more stable base for price appreciation. Uh, well, sorry, for, for price, um, let's call it price validation, right? What does it mean to, to pump a, the price on a token where only 1% of it is circulating, right? It makes more sense for lots of people to hold something, and that gives you more trust in its, its actual face value. So this is the, you know, this is the thing that I think, Crypto, the, the crypto world is eventually going to have to uh, come to terms with, and that is that deflation can be an extremely dangerous thing. For example, imagine that the um, that the accumulation of Doge continues um, in the way that it has, and eventually it's like five addresses that hold the entirety of, of the Doge supply. Is it still going to be worth as much as it is? Right? What if one person holds the entirety of the Doge supply? There are other systems in, in crypto right now that, are, that are, have set up these systems, I think, as an experiment, maybe as a joke, um, or maybe it's sincere, who knows. But things like Hoge, that, you know, uh, that burns tokens every time you transfer them um, to try and deflate the supply that way. It's worth asking the question, right, if that deflation that's causing price appreciation has a ceiling, because eventually there's going to be so few of it, and so few people will hold it, that its actual market relevance becomes obscure. And that's one of the things that we need to try and avoid if Bancor is going to become sort of a, a supranational, super blockchain currency, is that it needs to be distributed, it needs to have a lot of people holding it, um, and it needs to be accessible at any time. Um, and these are, the, these are the positive aspects of inflation. The things that people fear about inflation is always selling pressure. And that means um, you know, that we, we do need to make sure that we've got these deflationary mechan mechanisms in place to properly manage it. But I should point out that selling pressure doesn't go away just because something's deflationary. It just means it becomes concentrated. So all of the things that, that you know people become critical of when it comes to supply and, and distribution of tokens, I think is very poorly understood in cryptocurrency in general. Um, but in traditional economics, it's understood pretty well. And looking at those systems, deflation is usually the thing that hits hard and fast and you don't recover from. Whereas the uh, hyperbolic, you know, the, the hyperinflationary things are, are much, much further and, and, um, and fewer um, and generally not as catastrophic. That's a reverse Thank split. Thank you uh, for clearing that up. Um, before yeah. I get to this next question, um, for the BNT giveaway, for everyone listening, if you haven't already entered, uh, I believe you can see it in the space. I, I put the tweet in there. All you have to do is retweet and then follow me, me or two, Mark and Nate. Um, so if you want to go do that while we ask this next question, and uh, after the next question is answered, we can go ahead and get to the giveaway. Um, so Mark and Nate, my next question is, how does the XBNT work? I know the X token market is kind of new. Um, and if you could touch on the only getting charged two transactions, one when staking and one when unstaking, and uh, kind of the tax implications on that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, for the tax implications, I should just say straight away that I'm not, I'm not a tax attorney and whatever I, I say for, the, for this answer, make sure oh, that of course, of you course. don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, so this is how XPNT works. So um, currently the, the gas prices on, on L1 are, are prohibitive and um, in order to get maximum yields out of your BNT, sometimes it means actively, you know, 
managing those positions like once every 30 days, once every 40 days or something. And that means I'm staking your BNT, putting it into a, a different pool, and then you know taking into consideration the, the APY difference of that and the, the gas cost of, of, of performing it. Um, and so this kind of isn't really part of the you know the lazy liquidity message that, that we're hoping to send. Um, and it also forces users to, to contend with the, the gas fees on, on Bancor. So what XToken does is it says, okay, why don't you give this contract your BNT and it will stake and, re- and distribute and compound your rewards for you. And the XToken team, by the way, pays all of the gas costs associated with that. That's not reflected onto users. Um, and so what that allows for is... Um, a, a much more sort of automatic, self-driving version of, of BNT liquidity provision. Um, and um, the tax implications are actually quite profound. So depending on which jurisdiction you are, you are in and, you know, what the, the tax laws are for, for your area, the liquidity mining rewards are generally, so where I, I can speak from, from, let's just say, let's refer to my, my personal situation. Uh, in the, from the perspective of the Australian tax organization, all liquidity mining rewards are income, right? When I claim those rewards or when I restake them, that is an, uh, a taxable income event. And that is charged at, you know, um, a, a certain percentage based on my income bracket. And that income bracket, income tax is generally the, the highest uh, amount of tax that you pay. Um, whereas when I buy BNT at, you know, a low price and sell it at a high price, I only get charged capital gains, which is a, a much lower uh, taxable amount compared to income. Um, and if I hold it for a certain length of time, I even get a discount on my capital gains. So what XBNT allows me to do is I, I just put my BNT um, into this contract and it mints XBNT for me. And that XBNT has a value that accrues over time because the amount of BNT accumulating in the contract is accruing over time. But every time those rewards are delivered to the contract, that's no longer a part of my income tax. It's just a part of my capital gains tax because it's the um, the XBNT token itself that's appreciating in value. So the the potential tax relief that you get from using something like XBNT is, is quite large, um, even if the you know even if the X token contract is not as efficient as you could be by actively managing your stuff around. Remember, you're not trying to beat the contract. You're trying to beat the um, the income versus um, versus capital gains tax rate. Um, and certainly for me, that's that's unachievable even if i even if i was um at the the mo- the, the theoretical maximum efficiency of, of bnt management trying to get liquidity mining rewards um the the income tax uh ramifications of that would would dramatically outweigh the um the uh, the benefit of just getting charged um capital gains so that's kind of how xbnt works it's just a pool token where a contract is now taking care of all of the, the positions and you just watch that pool token grow in value at exactly the same rate that it would as if you were collecting the BNT rewards yourself. Oh, sweet. Yeah, so definitely something to look into if you are thinking about holding your BNT long-term, maybe over a year, uh, and really just believe in the protocol, which, I mean, I don't know why you would not. <laughs> uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, that's right. So if you're a long-term holder and you just want to LP lazily, like a you know maximum laziness, um, that's what XBNT uh, allows you to do. But you know there are going to be other staking services like this. So X Token was kind of a trailblazer. Um, the, the the product for for Bancor is new, but they've been around for a while. Um, they've got you know XKNC and X One Inch and other things. Um, but we've, we're also in discussions with with other professional staking services. Um, that are also facing sort of institutions. So there, there's, you know, on a recent phone call, I was told that there's about $21 billion in investment that wants to stake in Bancor, um, but they can't because of um, regulatory issues with the, the place where, where they're set up. And so staking in DeFi for retail is really easy and, you know, the... Um, the tax implications and everything are, are extremely transparent, and most governments around the world don't care if you're doing it as long as you pay the tax man. Um, but if you are a hedge fund or if you're managing like a pension fund or something, then there is a there needs to be a, an auditable um, provenance of custodianship, 
And so if you give your, if, if you create cryptocurrency with those funds and then put them in into Bancor, um, the, there is a, it's not just a regulatory, um, gray zone. It's, it's a regulatory black zone, right? These, these funds can't actually participate. And so there's this huge developing industry now, um, specifically to develop regulatory compliant staking services. And one of the ones that we spoke to recently is Stakeout. Um, and they were, I think that they're currently present on, uh, Beacon Chain. So they've got a, um, an Ethereum staking service, uh, for re- for institutional investors, um, that is, you know, earning something like 9%, um, staking rewards on, on Beacon Chain through the, you know, the charging up proof of stake mechanism for Ethereum 2.0. And, um, they are, working with Bancor right now to develop an institutional level uh, BNT staking service. Um, we're also talking with Swiss banks. So uh, if you sorry our news not long ago, but Swiss banks now accept BNT alongside um, the Swiss currency. And so um, we've been talking with them because they are interested in plugging in their um, internet banking um, applications directly into Bancor, allowing their uh, Swiss customers to use BNT directly um, on Ethereum to earn yields. Um, and so in a sense, that is another kind of, you know, regulated custodial service for staking. And there's going to be more and more of this. So XBNT is just the start. Eventually there's going to be, you know, a lot of these around. And so, and, and I just want to hone in on, on that one last point is that a lot of institutions that were not considering AMMs before, because you're essentially telling them, okay, well, it's dual, uh, token exposure. You're not just saying it's not single asset exposure. And also you can suffer this really uh, weird risk called impermanent loss. It wasn't something that they were willing to expose their funds to. But now when you can sort of guarantee single asset exposure and also protection, whereas the staking experience starts to feel more like a lending or, uh, you know, a staking on a, on a blockchain, uh, you know, where you're not exposed to pulling out less, cap, less uh, principal than you provided then all of a sudden it's becoming way more attractive for these institutions to participate as sort of passive uh, liquidity providers. And it's kind of people think that when they think passive liquidity provider, it's just, you know, your retail Joe Schmo uh, token holder. But it's also a lot of these funds, these pensions that have assets that are just sitting in their wallets and, and you know, they want a uh, return on them. So so it's, it's it's pretty exciting to see how fast some of these uh, institutions are now plugging into uh, these liquidity sources to to generate revenue on their on their holdings. So, Craig, do I have time for a quick question about? Yeah, Craig? you do. Um, I actually just posted on Twitter um, the live rolling of who the winner is. Link Prepper, if you're still in here, I just saw that you were in here. You won the B and T. Uh, if you did not claim it, Crypto Nubro actually was the the runner up ironic enough um but yeah man get with nate and get with mark and we'll make it rain make it rain bnts <laughs> yeah it's like a, it's like a, it's like a two thousand dollar t-shirt <laughs> <laughs> Currency for so the if, if, if you burn that thing you can get it mailed to you and then you also own the nft um on uh on open sea but yeah these are pretty weird weird they're basically t-shirts that are on bonding curves uh, and and they've been pretty cool to, to launch and experiment with, and definitely sort of first uh, foray for us into you know um, bonding curve, basically these types of NFTs. I kind of think of them as so. Uh, so yeah, that's awesome. You want yeah. that? Yeah, just my quick question about uh, the mindset that I worry about, like people who don't really understand DeFi is like banks right now are offering 0.015 APY, right? And then they see a company like Bancor and your guys are offering these 5%, 7%. Um, and you immediately, uh, without reading into it and understanding these things, uh, the too good to be true flags start going off. Can you guys elaborate kind of on like the security and safety of being a liquidity provider in retail? Yeah, for sure. So I think, you know, um, so in terms of, like, are you asking about, like, trust? Like, how should you feel 
Like, should you feel nervous about providing liquidity on Bank or something like that? Well, I guess I'm just uh, like the devil's advocate position of like, what can, what is the worst case scenario that can happen to my money if I'm a liquidity provider in the retail sense? If I'm going for yes. these higher gains and switching from the banking system to a DeFi system, what exact yeah, risk yeah, am yeah. I taking on? Yeah, yeah. So, okay, can you show protect against that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, um, one of the, okay, so where to start? Okay. So, usually when you're providing uh, liquidity on, on AMMs, the, the first risk is impermanent loss. And that's not something going wrong, right? That's just a, a market effect that it's hard to escape. And we ensure against that. So, that is its own, um, you know, you should feel much more comfortable uh, providing liquidity on Bancor than, than some of our competitors. Um, but then I think what you're talking about is more like the smart contract bugs, hacks, that sort of thing. Um, and this is obviously an, a, an omnipresent threat you know, on Ethereum. But remember, Vancor is a war-hardened project. Um, we have been around since since 2017. We've we've had um, people attempt to, to exploit the, the protocol for, for huge gains. Um, the you know the the dev team is not naive, right? We we know uh, who's coming to get us and we know how to protect ourselves from it. So, for example, I, do you remember earlier this year, flash loan attacks were this huge thing, right, where people could manipulate the virtual price of an asset and use it to, to drain uh, to drain funds from stuff. So this is something that we already knew was coming and it's impossible to perform a, a flash loan on, on Bancor because of the security mechanism that we have built into it. So the fact that this is happening on other protocols is, you know, it's kind of showing that there is sometimes a danger to becoming involved with a, a relatively green project, right? They they might be super clever, um, but without the um, you know without the strength of experience behind them, sometimes they just can't anticipate the kinds of things that, that are happening. So I'd say in general on DeFi, this is not just bank oil, by the way, but general advice: um, the older projects tend to be the, the the safer ones, and the newer projects tend to be the ones that are. Uh, much more susceptible to, to problems. Um, but, you know, th there is a, a system of, of auditing that um, allows uh, you to kind of evaluate even new projects as to how trustworthy they, they are. So if you follow the um, if you follow the audits, and you can also look at things like DeFi safety, which is kind of a, a third party um, impartial, uh, you know, trust aggregator, I suppose, for, for DeFi projects. Um, th these kinds of give you a, a, a relatively good idea of, of um, you know, what, what level of, of trust you can you can uh, afford a project. Um, but what I should say as well is that you know, Bancor realizes right. We we know that there are always these threats, and you know we're not gods. Uh, we know that there could be a new kind of exploit um, eventually, and you know that might target one pool or some pools. Um, and so for that reason, we cooperated with Nexus Mutual um, in order to incentivize um, their underwriters to, um, to start um, underwriting uh, insurance policies on, on Bancor. So uh, when we, before we started, um, Bancor was really a sort of unknown in the Nexus Mutual ecosystem. And it's now one of the, the, largest, um, the, the largest insured protocols by, by Nexus. So I think uh, just recently, the, the largest insurance um, policy ever paid on, on Nexus Mutual, or sorry, ever bought on Nexus Mutual, which was $34,429,500. Um, that was for a Bancor um, liquidity provider. So there are people that, you know, that if they contribute several billion dollars in, in liquidity are um, insuring against it using the... Um, you know, the relationship that, that we helped to establish with, with Nexus and their, and their user base. Um, so, yeah, we, we take these things very seriously. We, we are, you know, one of the most thoroughly audited um, DeFi protocols in existence. Uh, we have, I think, a 96% overall score on, on DeFi safety. And that includes, you know, uh, I think our audits rating is 100%. Code and team is 100%. Documentation is something like 96%. So, you know, the... We take this very, very, very seriously. We've been in DeFi for long enough to know um, how important it is to not get, you know, not get hacked, and also what hacks look like. It's why we we have, you know, some of the devs on our team that we have um, specifically to make sure that these things don't happen to us. 
So, yeah, I, I'm not sure if that comes necessarily um, all of your questions, but yeah, if you want to ask me something more direct, I'd be um, Yeah, it. definitely. I guess my secondary question, I guess, is, I mean, that's a totally in-depth answer to the question I had, but I guess my general question was, like, if you're trying to, quote-unquote, DeFi pill, like an elderly person, to switch from the, fi uh, the regulatory financial system and attempt things yeah. like DeFi, what what is kind of like the five minute elevator pitch in the security sense without going into the depths? You I, 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 you just covered I guess the same thing, but if you were to have to pitch Bancor to your elderly neighbor, how would you do? Um, first, I would ask my elderly neighbor what happened to them in two thousand and eight. Right, I know a lot of people that lost their um, superannuation, that lost their pension fund. I know a lot of people that lost their homes. Um, because the, the regulated financial sector bankrupted the whole fucking world. And, you know, I think that this is something that DeFi actually stands in opposition to, that we are trying to get around the, you know, the kind of risky shit that, that bankers uh, are pulling, you know, are trying to pull on us every day. And, you know, it's, it, you know I don't see DeFi as being any greater. Uh, I, I see DeFi as being a profoundly lower risk than what those guys are doing um, because, you know, I, I've been... I've been watching what happens in DeFi all the time, and I've never seen anything even, you know, nearly half as shady as, as what I think is, um, you know, a regular Tuesday in, um, in traditional finance. I don't know the I agree. You can, you can see, listen, if you're thinking like grandmother, you can see, you know, people, there's a reason banks exist. People want uh, people to insure their assets, right? So you can see that your grandmother would probably feel more comfortable going through maybe a bank that is fully insuring their assets. And, you know, currently that's probably not your grandmother's probably not going to take out smart contract insurance on Nexus. So in the short term, you know, I could see that being through a, you know, like a, an entity that takes on the smart contract insurance risk. Gotcha. Yeah. I guess that's just my question of the short term pitch to people trying to transition from, the shitty APY they're getting from banks, um, but also leaving the quote unquote security, the quote unquote low risk of the bank, even though DeFi, as we know, is much less of a risk than the uh, centralized banking system. But people who aren't aware of that are just naive and trust these systems. I, I guess that's just something I, I try and like formulate right when I'm trying to like, I don't know, onboard uh, relatives or something like that. It's just something I try to get from people who are more knowledgeable in the space of how they pitch it to others. Yeah, honestly, I, so I, I, know, I honestly find this is true in general. Um, it's never a good idea to try and change someone's mind. Uh, you have to let them change it on their own. So it's never a good, like, you know, I, I don't pitch things to people. I don't, um, I don't try to convince them that what, you know, that they should do what I'm doing or that they should feel how I feel. What I do is I try to explain why I'm doing something and let them make up their own mind as to whether I'm justified in my action. And I think that, you know, in a way, this is a much better way to, um, to kind of reconcile two different points of view. Because I think the, the, the minute you start trying to make someone do something or trying to convince someone to do something, humans have this instinct to immediately just trust it. Um, whereas if you kind of lead by example, um, humans follow the leader. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, a really, it's an interesting paradox, but, um, you know, a light touch. Um, and yeah, yeah, just do what you do and be open to discussion is generally the best way to make a difference. I, I totally agree. I guess pitch is totally the wrong word because like you said, if you pitch too hard or you force, they go the opposite way. I definitely think it's a lot more productive to show and explain that's i guess i was more or less looking for your guys's daily explanations to relatives about what you do maybe but you already answered it so thank you oh man i could talk for you know i could talk for ages i'm happy to hang out as long as you want me yeah i'm watching i'm watching the sunrise but but feeling pretty good about it so Hello, what time it was 5 a.m. around 10 here. Where are you? Yeah, I'm in, a, I'm in Tel Aviv, uh, in Israel. So I'm watching the sunrise on the Mediterranean right now, which looks pretty Whoa. fantastic. Uh, yes. 
Baycor Link uh, Mixer Retreats. I think we're looking at. I, I just made that up, but we should actually do that. Oh, oh damn! Man. I got excited as shit. I was like, "What the fuck?" I can't. We definitely could with the community. Yeah. Yeah. Where did you pull that up? He said Tel Aviv is real. He said Tel Aviv is real. Crap, dude. So, do you, uh, do we want to try bringing on someone from the audience? Yeah, you want to yeah. bring Dan? She had that question about Arbitrum. And then we could probably bring the uh, the winner of the BNT on, I think Brepper. Yeah, I've been really quiet. I'll go ahead and drop off. Let him, let him hop on. Yeah, of course. Thanks Thank for coming. Thank you for coming on, new bro. Who do we want to bring on first? Um, Either's fun. I know Jen had a question about Arbitrum. Oh, okay. Yeah, Jen... If you can request, Jen, or I can try and find you. I just invited you to speak, Jen. Uh, Mark, while we're in this little limbo, as a scientist, I'm very curious on your theory, uh, on your belief of the super cycle theory. to look more into it honestly I, i'm not let's say i'm not sold on it it okay. seems highly speculative it's pretty noisy definitely definitely i was just i'm very interested a lot of the people who are huge subscribers are deep in the game right like the people who are really pushing the narrative heavy believers are some of these hedge funds that are overly betting on the super cycle so i was just curious on maybe someone on an outsider perspective or a scientific perspective or what the scientific perspective or scientific community thinks of something like a, a new paradigm um but what what is like i don't know like do you guys even entertain those things uh when you're building things yeah, out i mean yeah i think this is uh this is a really great film by darren aronofsky called pi um, and the, the protagonist in that film, he, he like states these assumptions or something at, at the start. And he says that, you know, all, um, all, all physical phenomena, uh, can be represented by numbers. And if you graph or if you chart, if you analyze any, um, any system of numbers, patterns emerge. And so I, I think that there's, there is some truth to that. Um, I think that, you know, I don't think that anything that humans do, um, economically or financially, especially, um, are, you know, free from, um, this kind of, uh, you know, predictive analysis. I, I guess I'm something of a determinist in a sense. Um, I, I think that the financial markets or whatever, they're, they're, they're all, you know, this whole, everything that's always going on, um, can be, if you had a perfectly resolved information, um, you know, database, uh, you would be able to predict the next second and the second after that and the second after that. So it wouldn't surprise me, right? If, if the, a, a lot of the stuff that moves into, um, that, sorry, that is influencing people or convincing people that some of these the super cycle predictions are, um, are, are good, um, or that, you know, that any of its parts, right? Like things like Elliott wave analysis and, and you know, everything that it, that ends up in there. Um, I would think that there's probably some element of truth to it. Um, but, you know, as, you know, I, I guess this is my, my scientific background um, coming through, that I, I, I always reject everything until I'm convinced by it. Um, and at the moment, I don't, I, I don't think that there's enough, um, enough good evidence to be convinced that it's true. And so my default position is that it's not true. But that doesn't mean I'm, you know, I can't change my mind in a heartbeat. Exactly. That's exactly the answer I was looking for, is I think a lot of the, of course, uh, I'd be extremely happy if these <laughs> theories are true, right? Uh, anyone in this space would be. But like you said, it's I think it's dangerous to start hedging on these theories, and it's safer to, like you said, adapt as they become more true and just be aware of them. Yeah, exactly. Hi, guys. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> 
Uh, thanks for having me on. I just had a quick question. You know, since SmartCon last year, we've all been looking forward to Arbitrum, and I know that Bancor has been working with Arbitrum, and there have been some announcements as far as their progress, and I'm just kind of curious what Bancor's progress might be with Arbitrum themselves. Do you want to take this one, Nick? Uh, no, you can take it, Mark. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So, we, you know, we, we deployed uh, the bank code contracts on um, the Arbitrum testnet. Um, and, you know, that, that allowed us to, to measure the, the gas, um, and, you know, see how that environment behaved. And it looks really great. Um, the, we, we also know that layer two is going to be an extremely important part of the Ethereum and DeFi ecosystems into the future. And we, you know, we can't wait to, to, to get on it. Um, the question is, you know, the Arbitrum doesn't even have uh, its main net out yet. So there's no real work for us to do right now. It's like, you know, we, we announced months ago that we wanted to move on to Arbitrum. We've got, you know, something up and running on their test. Um, but until the main net is launched, there really isn't anything for us to do. So it's not like there's, you know, progress happening in the background or something towards launching on Arbitrum, we really need to wait for their um, infrastructure to be ready before there's anything for us to, to really do. Um, so, yeah, I, I still think that, that Arbitrum is likely to be like one of the premium um, L2 solutions, um, so particularly of the, of the three that are already available uh, or that you know, are going to be available soon. So out of Optimism, Polygon and, and Arbitrum, I do think Arbitrum is the, the superior tech, but Sometimes, um, you know, being being first um, with a, a similar solution is good enough. And so I don't think anyone can deny that Polygon has been extremely successful. Um, there's, it's got a lot of users up there now. And, you know, with Aave and Curve, um, you know, making making ripples up there, uh, you know, Polygon is now definitely under Bancor's purview. But I think everyone should be, you know, aware that, Bancor is a, um, a blockchain agnostic um, product. Uh, it's, I expect that we are going to not just be on Arbitrum, that we will eventually be on all layer two scaling solutions. Um, I expect that we're going to be on Ethereum. I think that we're going to be on Binance. I think we'll be on Solana. I think we'll be on XDAI. You know, we, the, we, we aren't married to Arbitrum as being, you know, the one L2 solution to roll them all, to rule them all. And even if we were, it's still only an L2 solution for Ethereum. Um, That's awesome. We need to yeah. Sorry. No, no, no. Continue. I guess I could have asked my question a little bit more broadly and said something about an L2 versus Arbitrum specifically. I, I posed the question about Arbitrum because that was what the talk had been in the past. Right. But yeah, it's nice so, about the L2s. Yeah, yeah. So we've got, you know, we're, we are, you know, uh, let's say cautiously, cautiously optimistic about Arbitrum um, and, or, um, you know, but we're not, um, we're not betting the farm on it. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Real quick, Mark, um, we have a question from someone in the office and, uh, I told him that obviously you guys do not give tax advice. So for Twitter listening, this is not tax advice. He's asking if somebody would want to cash out a million dollars, would it be wiser to take a loan, do multiple 100 grand transactions or what, what do you think on that or what anybody else in the speaking role? Yeah. I mean, it, it depends on what it depends on what tax law you, you fall under. So again, um, definitely you want to consult a tax attorney before doing anything. Um, but yeah, if you wanted to cash out a million dollars, there are a couple of interesting ways that you can, um, you can go about it. One is taking a loan against it, um, and then letting it become liquidated. So all loans are uh, tax free. So if you go to, if you go to, Maker, for example, with a million dollars of Ethereum and draw 660,000 or whatever the collateralization ratio is on Maker in DAI, all of that DAI is tax free. You don't, that's not income. You don't have to pay a cent on it. However, if you then sell that DAI on your centralized exchange back into US dollars or something, sometimes that is its own taxable event. So you might think you're doing something super clever and, you know, judging the tax there, but actually, you know, um, I promise that anything that you're trying to do to, to become tax, you know, to, to avoid tax, 
which is legal, by the way. You can avoid tax. You just can't evade it. Um, usually these things have been considered and there will be a, a mechanism in place to extract tax from you some other way. Um, so I, I, having said that, generally taking a loan is one of the preferred options um, for um, for trying to pay the, the least amount of, of tax possible on your cryptocurrency gains. I don't think multiple $100,000 transactions is a good idea because um, it's just going to, you know, it just sums it all up at the end of the, of the day anyway, or at least, you know, that's um, speaking from my understanding of my own tax law. Um, you know, ten one hundred thousand dollar transactions would be taxed exactly the same as one one million dollar transaction. Perfect. I think you answered this question. One thing. Uh, continue on that. Um, how the VB, uh, the VBNT, for example, if you use your VBNT to take a loan, yeah. as soon as you convert to, to another token, is that considered like a taxable event? Let's say because yeah. of how fast it is. Yeah, yeah. So this is interesting. This is something you can actually, um, you can, there is a, uh, in many tax jurisdictions, there is a, like a specific form that you can file for something to be classified according to, um, you know, a different version of the tax law. Because all of these things are just words, right? You know, what, what is a loan versus a swap, right? If you provide collateral and take someone else, you know, and take a loan, it looks a lot like a swap, right? You you left some some coins somewhere and you took coins exactly. from somewhere else, right? So um, yeah, often what you need to do is actually get a tax attorney to to draft up um, a, like a, an application for something to be held to um, you know some specific uh, tax regulation as opposed to another one. And this is totally fine. This is what, this is one of the reasons why tax attorneys exist um, is so that when you, you know, when someone's looking at, um, your accounts and they go, Oh, I want to tax it this way. Um, with the VBNT and the Vortex, you can actually say, well, actually this is much more like a loan. And I think that I'm, I can justify it being a loan. Um, so the, the, the answer is it's not clear cut with the Vortex because, um, you know, if someone was to audit your Ethereum, um, address record directly, it would look very much like a swap, in which case you're, you're paying tax, uh, you're paying capital gains on the things that you swapped. Um, but you could also take capital losses there, by the way, if the VBNT rate has dropped since it was, uh, awarded to you. Um, but yeah, if that ends up being a problem, I would just talk to a tax attorney and say, look, this is actually a loan. Um, and this is what I did and they will write it up and send it to the government for approval. Thanks. That's awesome. Um, I think uh, Yoda wants to come on as well. Get him in. Here it comes. Here it comes. <laughs> hey, gentlemen, I'm going to drop, but I want to say thank you for taking the time. It was highly informative and a lot of great tips and, and excellent perspective to see how you did the evolution of this and, and where it's heading. Thank you. It was my, it was my pleasure, Thank man. You, Thank you for being on here. Mark, we, we, Mark and Nate, we got a treat for you. We got our boy Coin Yoda. He's got a little something, something up his sleeve for you. <laughs> and they come out in Yoda's voice, so let's let it rip. Yes, I, 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 I hold chain link, of course. Of course, of course. Yoda. But I don't hold any new side my biggest bags, baby. I really, I, you know, I, I am uh, extremely concentrated on two projects. Thank you, Master Yoda. We appreciate your feedback. What is your long-term chain link price prediction? <laughs> Um, I, you know, the, I, I tend to not answer these questions because I don't want to be, uh, seen as insane, but also, uh, I have much longer time horizons than I think the, the average cryptocurrency holder. Let him rip, bro. I don't give a fuck if you, if we put you in a loony bun, I, I'll smoke that hopium right now. <laughs> Tell me what it is. Uh, I, well, uh, let's not, let's not go with the number, but let's talk about maybe the... 
of what the novel represents. I, I am 100% convinced in my bones that the whole world economy will be on blockchain within my lifetime. <clears throat> All right. Yeah, if chain link is important, and it's going to be central to you know having a quadrillion dollars of of value on on blockchains and communicating between those blockchains. I mean, Where it's like chain link sit on the market cap rankings. I think I think at most I think everyone is convinced that chain link will eventually be you know. Yeah, uh, dare I to, to say it? It should be number one. Maybe not right now, but it should come. Um, I think that once uh, the, the financial markets are, you know, entirely serviced by blockchains, there's going to be so much need for information to spill out of, you know, human society and into these blockchains. And I don't see anything competing with Chainlink at this stage. So yeah, I I, I think that something as useful and as important as that. Will trump everyone. Any one hundred single quote S. <laughs> I didn't understand. Yeah, that. we lost you on that one. Say it one more time. Oh, he said it goes a hundred X. All right. I mean, maybe maybe this is everyone's best. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> yeah, you were coming on your phone. I totally agree. Nate, do you subscribe to any prices or are you in the mark thing of you don't want to talk about numbers? I I think there's someone in what well, uh, a lot of the I don't know talk uh, we hear is like I don't know if it does become these top market caps like we see we could see millions of dollars per link right. Like, it's not infeasible. The other problem is that, you know, when we talk about the price itself, we always talk about it in US dollars. Ah. And, and so the numbers can get very, very high, but it's not necessarily, you know, I, I'm, it's not that the, the value of these things isn't appreciating, because they certainly are. But one of the problems is that the, the unit of measurement that we, that we deal with is constantly becoming debased. Correct. Good point. Uh, I have a question because yesterday we were talking about like the banks and the adoption of blockchains and stuff. Since you guys are probably one of the first blockchains, oh, sorry, one of the first like networks and protocols to integrate with us with a bank, uh, how was that experience and how do you see like other banks reaching out and uh, like doing partnerships with blockchains and the networks and protocols? Yeah, I think, so Bancor is unusually well positioned to do this. Um, so, you know, we're an older project. We come from the ICO era. And the, the funds that were raised to support Bancor, um, we used to establish the, a nonprofit called the Bancor Foundation. And it's that foundation that you apply to, um, for grants and things if you want to do, you know, if you want to become a, a Bancor developer or if you want to do some, some work for Bancor and improve the protocol. Um, but the Bancor Foundation, um, because it is a, you know, an established, uh, entity, it's not an anonymous team or something. It makes it, um, you know, it makes it very easy to talk to regulators with and to talk to banks with. Um, so, you know, we, we have our own legal team that, um, makes sure that Bancor is compliant. Like everything that the Bancor protocol does has to be simultaneously observant of EU regulatory policy and also US regulatory policy. So we, we're on very firm ground and we have a very good relationship with, with regulators, um, who, you know, who have had Bancor under the microscope for, for a very long time. Um, and so, yeah, the, those relationships are, are very positive. And, you know, though it's through those relationships that you end up getting to, you know, talk to bank managers and, um, you know, and hedge fund managers and that sort of thing. So I think. For some projects, it's going to be much more difficult than how it was for Bancor because we have this, you know, suit and tie, um, you know, non-anonymous and, you know, very well founded institution that represents us. So we can, we get to have these conversations with, you know, with, with TradFi in a very straightforward way, right? As if Bancor was, you know, uh, a, a normal financial institution, a normal financial business. 
Um, whereas, you know, things like, you know, uh, a lot of the, the meme clients, for example, even though the projects are, are stellar, right? I, I don't, I'm, I, I'm not here to, um, you know, I, I don't want anyone to think that I'm, uh, you know, try to deprecate the, the value of some of the, the projects that have silly names attached to them. Um, but it is going to be more difficult for something that, you know, has named its its uh, company after, um, you know, something gimmicky. Come right um, To have a... <laughs> well, I can't say pancake swap. I can't say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Swiss <laughs> bank doesn't want to buy anything called Come right? Exactly. Exactly. And, and so, the bank's yeah. not going to be happy with a pancake swap on her portfolio or something like that. Yeah. Wow. Right, and so and, and so we don't really struggle with that so much, um, and I, and also you know even when, I, I do think that you know something like sushi for example, even though it used to have the you know be seen as kind of a gimmicky name or whatever, it's important to remember that Google was once a very strange sounding word and people thought it was a joke. So I do think that these things can enter the mainstream and there will be a cultural shift and that sort of thing, but it takes time, um, and I think that Bancor is kind of ahead of the curve a little bit because we have been you know, knee deep in regulatory affairs since 2017. And if you're a new project and you're just getting established on, on DeFi, um, I'm not sure how that's going to, you know, how much you're going to uh, enjoy doing that stuff when you have to sort of uh, dig into to the token treasury in order to um, hire, you know, a lawyer team or something like that. And so Vancor is extremely well stuffed. And yeah, our, tra uh, our transition into the banking sector I think was enabled by, you know, these kinds of relationships that we've been developing and not all projects enjoy that. Yeah, we also started as a customer to a lot of these banks, uh, you know, just to, to do our banking services as a foundation that needs to pay out grants and hold, hold funds. And then they started to understand the product and want to offer these APRs to their customers. Obviously, like we were talking before with the savings deposit rates in most banks being so like uh, abysmal. And, uh, and so I, I think the, the demand has started, has caught me off guard. Actually, this came up probably about six months ago and we've been uh, sort of behind the scenes building the infrastructure ever since. And, uh, but, but to see the banks plugging into the system and the demand and the sort of acceptance from their customers to kind of potentially experiment with, with this uh, this new type of income uh, is really awesome to see, and and I wasn't expecting it to happen that fast. Oh, very very interesting. <clears throat> we have a question from one of the guys in the audience. He actually just requested uh, Mewtwo. If you want to bring Defi Skeeter on, he actually yeah, like, he's on. Bring him on right now. You just gotta hit on mute, bro. Let it rip. Hey guys, <clears throat> thanks for. Especially a quick question um, we heard from Sergey uh, last week. Um, his panel, um, he kind of explained what their, their team motivations were. And I was just kind of wondering, what, what motivates you guys? You know, we, we kind of heard from them what their motivations were in kind of changing society and uh, adapting smart contracts. But, uh, you know, what kind of motivates you guys? Mark, you take this one off. Um, I think Mark might be having some trouble or he's thinking really hard. So, uh, Nate, if you want to pick up. Yeah, I think, I, I don't know, Spaces disconnects speakers sometimes. It's pretty buggy since the new update, so he might have lagged out. Yeah, he's a listener now. So if you could just <clears throat> talk until he's back on. Yeah, go for it. It just seems to be just Mark. So... I think uh, this idea of basically having loads and loads of assets that can be launched and have quick access to liquidity. Um, you know, I think that the idea that anyone can sort of start a, a currency and immediately give their sort of token holders access to sort of a lending channel. Uh, where they can generate revenue from providing a service, liquidity service to the token project is pretty powerful. I mean, the sort of liquidity of first resort. And that's, that's kind of what got me into Bancor in the beginning is this powering the sort of long tail of assets and allowing them to be, you know, easily interchanged and, and used. And, uh, so yeah, the, 
whole idea of currency creation, I think, is is probably what what motivates me and, and the role of liquidity in that. Sorry, I got I got dropped, so I didn't I didn't hear the question. Hey, Mark. Sorry. Yeah, the, the question was was just simple, and and it was what motivates you. You know, we kind of heard from Nate, but can you be oh. on, on what drives you? Yeah, I mean, so there's a couple of ways that I can answer. Um, but you know, one comes back to um, how I introduced myself. I think at the beginning of this um, at the beginning of this talk, which is that I think you know. More than anything else, I want to um, I, I want to have agency and I want to affect change in the things that I do. Right. So if I can spend some time and effort working on something that other people value, that's you know that's the the best kind of fulfillment that I think that I, that I can get. It's, it's how I want to spend my life doing stuff is you know for for others to you know to, to so that we can enjoy you know the the fruit of, of this work together. Um, I think that as a scientist, that's what I wanted to do. And now that I'm in finance, that's what I want to do. Um, but then there's a, you know, specifically within DeFi, right? There's a, a whole bunch of stuff that I could have um, become involved in. The, the question of why did I come to Bancor is, is, is slightly more interesting. Um, because it wasn't necessarily the first project that I, that I dabbled in. I, I actually came to Bancor via Kyber Network, um, just as a community member. Um, but you know, when I was studying the, the tokenomics of some of these different protocols, there was something about Kyber that just kind of stood out to me as being really interesting because it's, you know, you hold this, this token and it delivers you Ethereum for revenue. And I was like, wow, that's such a, such a neat idea. I wonder how it's doing that, you know? And then when I looked into it, I was like, wow, K and C holders are completely useless, right? We don't even need them, right? The, the protocol would, would function without them. And in fact, it would make more money without them. Like, why are we paying Ethereum revenue to people that aren't actually doing anything to the protocol? And I, as I came to that realization, I started feeling like really icky about it. Actually, like I, I, I felt like I was exploiting the the people on on Kyber's network um, for for money that I didn't really deserve. And I, I part of me felt like that was, you know, it's not just unsustainable, but it's kind of morally abhorrent. And that was like my, my first introduction to, to DeFi tokenomics. Um, and after I realized how parasitic that is, how predatory that, that kind of tokenomic model is, um, I started looking around for, for tokenomics that I think make societal sense, right? Not just, you know, investor sense. Um, and I eventually, you know, through, uh, through indirect means and through a large number of other projects, I eventually came across Bancor. And I think that this is the first example in, in DeFi where the, you know, well, the first example that I came into contact with where the tokenomics are aligned with, you know, the, the game of like everyone working for, um, for mutual benefit, right? It's not that the bank core holders are exploiting token liquidity providers. We are supporting them, right? We, we take on the risk of inflation so that they can provide liquidity. And when they provide liquidity, they make our, our uh, protocol stronger and um, we share in, in revenue generation together, right? I think that this is a, a much better um, economy to, to be involved with than the, the kind of stuff I was doing before. So, yeah, I, I see, you know, Banco for me is a collaboration, right? It is the, it's the, a, a glue, it's a, an infrastructure, it's a resource that the rest of DeFi is invited to use with us, right? And not only do you, know, we're not going to charge you for it. In fact, we, you know, we help you make money because when you make money, we make money. And that's, that's what drives me in a sense, or that's what drove me to Bancor. Mark, if I could ask you to elaborate on that in a sense, because <clears throat> it's clear to me from that speech you just gave, you're coming at your vast uh, understanding of tokenomics and the importance of tokenomics versus the economic side of things. Uh, would you be able to explain kind of like your research process? Because uh, in a lot of this uh, crypto space, a lot of people are basing their investments off of like technical analysis, right? That's why you see like Doge yeah. pump and stuff. But from the scientific perspective, the Doge investment doesn't really hold water, right? Because you look more into the uh fundamentals of things and tokenomics um well i'm not saying that dogecoin is i would never say that dogecoin was 
with his bad in and of itself. I think the I think the Doge Prime fundamentals are okay. It's actually the economics of Doge that are broken. Yeah, I guess I just Doge Prime was yeah. I, I misspoke in bringing up Doge. I guess just your process in weeding out uh, projects that have legs and strong fundamentals versus just strong technical analysis, right? And like where you yeah, place your long term, your long term bags, or your long term focus on projects, not just based off the charts looking great, but how you yeah. go into the research process of tokenomics. I think that's important because a lot of people are so focused on making money that charts is all they're worried about. Generally, pretty dubious of its predictive value. Um, you know, coming back to what we said before about stupid topics and whatnot, I think that it does have predictive value, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be able to predict what happens. So, TA is not necessarily the best way to make a decision. Um, and for me, I'm not just in this to make a lot of money, right? I, I'm in this to um, to change, you know, to, to change finance. I, I want the world to be different than how I found it because of things that I've done. Um, and you can do that with capital, right? Supporting the right project mean it can be the same as as um, as influencing it. Um, so in, in my case, I'm extremely lucky that I get to do both, right? I, I have capital in the project, and I'm um, an active researcher in in, um, in changing the, the direction, the decisions that are made. But uh, coming back to the, the the question that you asked, which is, you know, how did I make that decision? I think that there are a couple of like quick litmus tests that you can use to evaluate um, whether or not a, uh, a token or a project is, is doing something right. Um, one is, do people need the token? So something like Ethereum passes this test with flying colors, right? If you want to use the Ethereum network, you need the Ethereum token. It's, it's the, the simplest kind of economic, um, the simplest kind of economic test that there is. Um, in the case, and, and does Ethereum, like, it's not enough just to need it, right? It can't just be decreed that someone needs the token. It would be nice to know that the, the system itself is contingent on the token being there and being used. So the Ethereum also passes this test quite well because um, you, without the Ethereum um, token being present, then the node operators would have no incentive to secure the network, right? Bitcoin also um, has this same thing going for it. If the, if the Bitcoin ecosystem if we can call it that, right? The Bitcoin blockchain is, is important and people want to transact using it, then Bitcoin is required to pay Bitcoin miners to secure that blockchain um, for their services. So these kinds of things pass the, 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 the most basic of um, the most basic tests, but that's not enough. You also need to ask, is the, the service that, that thing is providing, is it important, right? Do people want it? Um, is it going to be um, is it going to be something that uh, that society in general values, right? Is uh, is it important for businesses to be able to, to function properly? Is it important for, I don't know, for people to be able to use their mobile phones? Is it important for, you know, does it make cars go? All of this stuff, right? Um, that's another part of fundamental analysis that I think usually goes under the radar because something like, you know, making the game theory really good um, doesn't necessarily mean that you've achieved something important because there are board games that have good board, that have good game theory that the you know the currency associated with it is is completely worthless and it's because the board game itself doesn't achieve anything um, and so this is where for example Chainlink um, has one of the best um, value propositions around because we it is absolutely certain that information from outside blockchains we need to get inside blockchains in order to do things. Um, and so those are the kind of those are the two fundamentals that I really pay attention to. One is that is the token itself required in order to perform the function, and then is that function valuable? Do will people pay for it? And if it passes both of those tests, you've probably found something, um, in my opinion, that, that's worthy of your money. Um, if it fails one of those tests, it's not necessarily that it's not worth your money, but it might not be worth long term speculation. Short term speculation though is fine. I think. You know, speculative value is still something that, that should be considered. You know, there are some things that are worth buying just because they're so fucking cheap and it's likely that they're going to increase the same way that there are some horses that are just so fast that it's a, a good idea to, to bet on them. There are some, you know, 
poker hands that are so good that you would want to bet on them. Um, so, you know, if you're making money alone is the, the thing that you're interested in, then technical analysis, I think, is, is um, the, the thing that you want to do. But if you're in it for the, you know, the, the culture, if you're in it for the, um, the grander uh, scheme of things, right, the actual influence that cryptocurrency can have on the world, then I think fundamental analysis is a, a, much, better, um, a much better avenue to pursue. I had, a, I had a question to bring it back to uh, Bancor. Um, this might be a little bit more up Nate's alley. Uh, you know, my question is like, what, what does the future of Bancor look like over the next five to ten years? Like, do you guys envision users interacting directly with the DAP, or do you kind of envision a future where users are interacting through an API with their traditional institution? I think I think both. Um, you know, I think we will always have a strong preference of having a multitude of uh, front ends to access the network. If, say, you know, you want to remove your stake instead of having to go to, you know, Etherscan to do it, if there's ever like an outage with a, a website, you can go to another interface to do it. So that'll always be preferable. On, on Bancor's side, though, I think we do see the Bancor.network front end really becoming a sort of financial platform that basically you can have as many assets, you know, permissionlessly uh, listed and being able to access uh, IO protection for their pools when they create pools. Um, so really having as many assets as possible. And then for LPs to access the sort of suite of, of DeFi services. And at the core of that is the sort of profitability of the market making and fees that happens uh, on the exchange. And, um, uh, and then lastly, just be really evolving, you know, Bancor.network into a way more trader-focused interface that has, like, all these novel features that we have in trading, like limit orders and, um, you know, f smooth fiat gateways for, for newbies and, um, you know, transaction history and charting where you can really see, like, all the analysis. So, um, yeah, I would say that's the kind of vision, uh, vision of it. Yeah, like a follow-up question is, you know, because, you know, I, I think the writing is on the wall for a lot of uh, banking institutions to where they're going to be forced to pivot to be more competitive as uh, DeFi becomes more mainstream and, you know, the knowledge gets out there. So I'm just curious from your guys' perspective, you know, do you guys envision, a, and I think you hinted at this earlier with some uh, institutions wanting to get in, but the regulatory clarity is just not right. There. So is it kind of one day in the future, what we'll see is uh, larger institutions adopting the Bancor protocol and you'll see their adoption play out in their product offerings, you know, in our grandparents' savings accounts, basically the time yeah. Connor was asking earlier. Yeah, that's exactly how I see it playing out. I, I, I see banks will start to wind down their, um, their financial activities in, you know, in traditional finance stuff. Although there, it's not going to go away. There are going to be, you know, real world facing financial applications that will always be difficult for blockchains to deal with, although I think that that will get narrower and narrower over time. Uh, but yeah, banks, banks and, you know, savings funds and building funds and all of these things, I think will eventually just become super users of DeFi. Um, and so they will become, you know, like JP Morgan Chase could just become like one giant X token service, if you know what I mean. Where they take uh, user funds and distribute them into DeFi, um, you know, as they as they as they wish. So their their actual agency over what happens will start to diminish because DeFi, if if anything, um, should start to become highly automated, uh, and that's the goal. Um, but yeah, their their actual you know their responsibility, their um, importance uh, is going to start to to diminish. I think that they're going to become yeah basically. Um, a, a glorified um, account keeper. Yeah, and you know, I think that's where a lot of the power will be, right? Uh, if one thing crypto has taught us, it's the power of a network. And so, at the end of the day, if I think you know, if they're able to hold on to that network power share, but on the back, yeah, they're never and honestly, a lot wiser. Yeah, and honestly, I want them to. You know, I, I think that they it will. It, it will start to serve like a, an organizational function, right? And like organizing that many users um, to, you know, to do certain things might be tricky. 
I think one of the one of the good examples is something like crypto.com and the way that they're handling stuff, right? Because they're, they're basically a, a financial institution now. And so they've got, you know, this, this big deal with, um, with Ledger um, so that basically all of customer funds are, are held in hardware wallets or I think it's like 95% or something are always in hardware wallets. Um, that kind of thing means that, you know, it's like crypto done right, but for, for, so that dummies or, you know, people, not even dummies, right? People that just don't have the patience or time to, to learn how to do this stuff um, will always have the, you know, they will, it will mean that there is still someone who's willing to provide a gateway into cryptocurrency for them. And I still think that that is worthwhile. Um, I just don't want them driving cryptocurrency. Hey, um, I have a question about the ecosystem. I know on you, you guys have a, a big focus on making sure that the ecosystem is unique or proprietary where, you know, so you can't get forked or copied, um, like, uh, Uniswap obviously did. So my question is, what about your ecosystem can't be copied? And why wouldn't they, or and why can't they copy impermanent loss and uh, one-sided transactions? Mark, you want to go ahead? Oh, do we lose Mark again? Yeah, I still see him in here. He might be lagging out. Yeah, I think it'd be best to, to cover this. Um, but but one, one thing to point to initially is the token and the sort of token distribution. Um, so that actually serves kind of a, a, a major role in the network where it's essentially DNT holders who... Are, you know, we've, we've coordinated them into agreeing to take on this potential risk of impermanent loss. And, um, you know, coordinating, first off, building Uniswap around Uni is a decision they'd first have to make. And they'd also have to uh, turn the token into an elastic supply token. Um, so those are some pretty like major shifts to make in their protocol. And, and we see that they can, you know, take that direction in V3. Um, you know, but to, to copy us, uh, you know, anything's possible. All our smart contracts are open source, but really coordinating the VNT holders that we have. Oh, Mark just messaged and he said that, uh, Mark said he can't get back in. So he's trying to get back in. But to coordinate that, uh, you know, uni holders uh, around a similar model is is pretty difficult. Now, we are seeing some liquidity layers um, emerge on top of Uniswap that are, you know, trying to cover the risk of impermanent loss and, and provide insurance. Uh, I just think we, we see that being more efficient at the uh, protocol layer. And, you know, they, they took Uniswap in their recent version to kind of like a opposite approach to dealing with impermanent loss. It's more like impermanent loss uh, can be hit, you know, very easily. And uh, uh, for anyone who's not paying attention and who's not tracking the price ranges that you provide liquidity in. So um, does that does that answer your question? You know, I'd also it, love to hear from Mark other. It does about Uni uh, specifically, but I'm also curious about Curve because um, I know that they also, they're the only ones that are major players that use Link Oracles. So I kind of discount other companies if they're not at least using Link Oracles. I mean, I still haven't done my due diligence with Balancer, but I was kind of speaking broadly to the whole um, category, DEX category. Yeah, yeah. That's fair. Um, and, you know, there, there, are things I, there are things I really want to say that um, I probably shouldn't. But let's let's just I know you know no, anything bad by the way about um, about Curve or Uniswap or any any of our other competitors. Um, there there are things I want to tell you about Bancor that I've been told not to. Um, but you know, speaking generally, one of the I think that one of the things that you should start thinking about is now that we've got this elastic supply and we've got all of this liquidity, 
what are the what are the things that there are things that the you know bank or the BNT token has a very specific use case, but is that the only thing you can use it for? I think that as the the market continues to develop, you're going to start seeing more and more creative things coming out of, of Bancor, and it's going to start looking very different to how it looks today. And I think that the the way that we set up our supply, the way that we've set up the community, and the um, you know the foundation that we have as a liquidity network, it empowers a lot of a lot of other things. Um, that I think are, um, you know, important and valuable. And so I think as we start to get momentum on this, it's not even necessarily the case that I think we have a, this infinitely defensible mode. I, I think that we will have, you know, I think that we will have a lot of momentum once, uh, once the, the picture starts to come into focus for what we're actually trying to achieve. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't think the curve is going away. I don't think Uniswap is going away. I don't think SushiSwap is going away. Um, I think that we will start to, to cater up to, to different corners of, um, of the ecosystem, and we already see that happening. So Uniswap, for example, with, with V3 is quite obviously catering to professional market makers um, and aren't necessarily that interested in, um, in uh, retail liquidity um, anymore, which is fine, uh, whereas Bancor is. And so the question should be, why are we interested in liquidity retail? Right? Is it is it just to support swaps? Right? What are the what are the things that that BNT can do that other other tokens can't? Um, and you know, I think maybe that's a a good question to leave you with. I we, I, I have an answer for it. I just can't tell you what it is. Unfortunately, I, I, uh, I'm sorry to tease you with it. Is there yeah, any timeline? Maybe thing. you could say. No. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, the the kind of the. The vision that we're building for, for, for Bancor in, internally has been subject to like, you know, some of the longest and most frequent phone calls that, that I've ever had of, of any job in my life, right? We, there was one week where I had um, a four hour phone call every day for five days. Um, it was all just about, you know, what, what's the, the long term strategy, the long term mission of, of Bancor. And, you know, the, it got, it, it's really exciting. And I think that, you know, the, uh, the the timeline is is going to be you know it, it's not like this is going to happen in a few weeks or you know or even a few months. There, in order to achieve what, what we're hoping to achieve, it's going to take these you know there are going to be cornerstones. There's going to be you know these capstone moments where you're going to start seeing what it is that we're that we're trying for. Um, but you know look. Well, one of the things I can tell you is that uh, one of the items on my agenda after I finish the, the spec doc for our you know, architecture upgrade um, is to uh, start recomposing the, the bank or white paper and, and release a new version of it. And so, you know, all of the answers that you want, will I, I, I expect will be contained in that document. And I, I hope to have that out by the end of the year. Le- leading off that, I, I'm going to speculate here. Um, in, in your white paper, you guys specifically call out the coincidence of once um, and how that kind of plays a instrumental role and kind of like a philosophical role for the BNT token. It provides a common unit of account basically when bartering. So the way I look at BNT is if you have a massive liquidity pool uh, across many different assets um, and it's that common unit of account, DeFi, to me, seems the first stepping stone of a potentially very deep, liquid, common unit of account uh, currency to where you can build services outside of DeFi on top of this protocol, which will further increase demand, which will further increase liquidity, and which will go beyond you know just DeFi, and you'll have potentially many different markets and services built on this protocol. Um, I don't know if you can if you can comment if that's like being around the bush, but is that like a fair assumption or is that uh, a not realistic viewpoint of uh, a potential like future projection? I mean, I, I can't I can't confirm or deny anything, um, and you know I need to make sure that whatever my answer is doesn't speak to you know um, whether or not that 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 is what we're doing or, or what we're not doing. Right? I need to make sure that I stay straight down the, the fence. What I will say is that. Um, what you what you have presented 
um, I think makes a lot of sense. And that I imagine that many different uh, participants in DeFi are probably considering something just like that. I have a question in a totally different direction, if you guys don't mind. Of course. So, Mark, you have gone through this experience, and I apologize, Nate, but this is specifically for Mark. If you have an opinion, obviously I would love to hear it, but... That's right. Uh, I was going to say it anyway. <laughs> All good. So, All so good. Mark, Mark, you've been through this uh, experience of transitioning out of this scientific career and in, into a much more financial uh, environment. So if you were going to do that today, knowing everything that you know now or if somebody else was going to do that, do you have any suggested like resources, reading material, books, anything like that that you would tell somebody like this would help get you up to speed? Oh, uh, man, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, it was a learning, – learning DeFi for me took like um, – you know, it, it took a long time. Like you, you've got to be – You've got to be on, on top of everything. So honestly, the, the places where I started were YouTube, right? And even the, the shitty, you know, shield channels are a good place to get started. Um, but just learning about, you know, what, what projects are doing and why they're doing it, um, you know, getting on uh, on Discord and Telegram. Telegram ended up being such a, an important resource. Um, but yeah, first kind of just scoping out everything. But then in terms of the actual deep uh, finance fundamentals and, you know, being useful, as a, a person in, in DeFi, um, that's really going to depend on on um, what it is someone is, is interested in working on uh, working on with you. Um, if, if you're doing you know game design and um, and economic theory, then I would say that you know there's there are many good places you can start there. Um, one is just by reading economics papers. Um, you know the, there is a Nobel Prize in economics awarded every year. Have a look at you know what what it was that they won the Nobel Prize for and, and see if you can understand why why it was important, that sort of thing. Um, if you want to get into development, obviously you need to be, um, you, need, you, know, you need to have a, a lot of programming prowess. And I don't, by the way, like I, I, I can quote in, in Python, I'd say that I'm in, you know, intermediate to advanced in Python, but I, I don't speak uh, Solidity or Rust or, or any other smart contract languages. Um, yeah. but I can tell you that, I can tell you that having that coding skill, even just in Python, it's good because a lot of the things that you're going to do require you to, you know, to create simulations or to create financial models or to process ridiculous amounts of data or to scrape data from somewhere else. And so just starting in any programming language is usually good enough to, to become useful. But if you actually want to, um, you know, write the smart contracts themselves, I mean, there's no two ways about it. You're going to have to, you know, become a, become a Solidity developer and, um, and really you know, prove your, your metal through, um, sure. through uh, you know, creating stuff. So, so I've been, yeah, and I, so uh, the reason I'm asking this question, so, and, and this is kind of specific to me, I guess, but I have a physics degree and I've been doing Solidity since 2017, but I haven't really explored the econ side of this as much. And since, uh, since the 2018 crash and everything, I kind of switched gears and, and my wife and I are both developers. So now, so we launched a SaaS product and that's kind of been what we're doing, what we've been doing. So I kind of, I did a lot of hardcore solidity in 2017, early 2018. And now I'm kind of coming at it from this perspective of an investor and thinking like, you know, if I wanted to get deeper into this from a slightly different angle, and wanting to understand the economics better. Cause like, I do understand like buy pressure, like, like I understand tokenomics to some degree because I was a part of those conversations back when, like I worked for a company, uh, and I don't want to get into the details too much. Um, but like we, we got like a million from Polychain and like we were pretty into it, but the founders were just like so much more into like the, the econ stuff, obviously. And so I'm just trying to play catch up a little bit, I guess, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, if you want to get into that stuff, I honestly, the best thing to do is to just start start reading and start having conversations about it. It's like anything else. If you've got a, a physics degree already, then, you know, the, the, the quantitative um, aspect to, to finance is probably not going to be um, at all challenging. Um, sometimes economics, though, can be a little bit more abstract. And um, for, for that, yeah. you know, it's... Um, 
you know, even just like there are some board games that are really good at, at teaching you these things. So like there's a, a board game developer called U Rosenberg, um, who's developed entirely economics based um, games. Um, and, you know, just by just by playing these things, you start to understand a lot more about what the value of debt is, like why debt has a dollar um, value associated with it. Um, you start to learn more about, you know, the idea of, um, you know, like what, what an option is and, and what a futures market is and, and why these things exist, you know, like, yeah. yeah you know, I, game so, game? yeah. And who makes it? Uh, this is a big, big game. So there are a couple. So the, the developer, the board game designer, his name's U Rosenberg. So e, U-W-E Rosenberg. And um, he's most famous for two board games. One is Agricola, which is about the economics, or, you know, the, it's themed around uh, uh, farming economics in, like, you know, the pre-industrial age. And then there's another one called Harv, um, and that one's a much more sophisticated sort of um, finance-based and resource-based trading game. Um, but, yeah, there's no element of chance to these games, or at least the element of chance to these games is, is minimal. And what you're really trying to do is is develop the best economic um, strategy um, throughout the game to, to defeat your opponent. They, so these kinds of things are actually a good place to start in order to get, like, in, I would say an intuition in economics. That's extremely interesting. I'm definitely going to check that out. Thank you so much. And also, I mean, if you want to just get your hands dirty, you should pair that with finding a protocol that you can, like, study and maybe proposing stuff in their governance and starting with like proposals and you know really getting your hands dirty in, a, in an actual like uh protocol and, and on that same note for nate and mark uh if you are there what other job opportunities or lanes are there outside of smart contract developing developing in the crypto space for people who are trying to switch industries so i don't know we have a full economics team that we has been like crucial to, to building this protocol. So, you know, I think there are, you know, economic and incentive design, uh, roles that'll start coming up more and more. Um, and then, you know, it, I think DeFi is at a moment where it's starting to get access by, you know, more mainstream people and, uh, the DeFi protocols are really going to start to have to actually market themselves as sort of tech startups. And so I think there's going to be more roles for traditional growth marketing, advertising uh, in in DeFi. And, uh, and then research, which is like, you know, somewhat specialized um, and, and probably aligned with economics and, and just business development stuff too. Like, you know, some of these... Uh, you can tell there's like real, real business minds behind some, some, you know, look at like uh, pancake swap coming up with all these like lottery games and user acquisition. Um, and then a lot of what Mark and I do is, uh, business development, like connecting with other projects, um, seeing what, what overlap we have, what type of integration might make sense, you know, how to educate them on, uh, getting liquidity and getting a deep, deep pool and engaging their, uh, communities around it so that's like the soft the soft skills that i think are you know around it around a bangor thank you i think that one of the i'm not sure how to phrase this because it, it sounds it sounds insulting at first but i don't really mean it to me but i remember when i was a kid and the pokemon craze was just getting started, right? So they had the, the two Game Boy games and then kind of this, this rush of culture, like plush toys and um, TV shows and like all of, the, all of the adult toy makers in the world or, you know, people that could see that the industry was worth a lot of money, but were so fucking confused as to what it all meant, you know? Like they didn't understand what these, what these cartoon characters were and, you know, they trying to explain it to an adult back then was, was really confusing. And so I think that... Um, I can't remember exactly who it was, but I have a feeling it was one of the large um, television um, uh, you know, producing, you know, one of the, the, the big uh, television agencies in the, in the United States became famous for um, hiring the, the world's youngest consultant 
Um, so they had, a, I think, a nine-year-old um, on a 250K salary just to advise on the Pokemon craze because no one could no one could understand it or decipher it. Um, I can't remember if, you know, the details of that story are probably entirely incorrect, but, you know, look me up and you can you look it up and you'll probably find what the actual, um, you know, the details really are. Um, but having said that, I think that there is going to be you know, something of a, a DeFi soothsayer or, you know, a DeFi translator type role developing where people that understand what DeFi means and what blockchains are and that kind of thing. Um, I imagine that there are going to be customer facing roles for, for people that just have knowledge of it. Um, probably finding positions at a lot of major bank, uh, uh, you know, major banks and, and other financial institutions just to help you know, the, the people from the TradFi world that may never really fully understand what, what's going on, um, just give them sort of, um, you know, a, a rail or something to hold on to while the while this industry takes off. And and I'd say the best way to connect with a protocol that you're interested in is to do educational content on top of that, like guide users through how to stake, how to do all this. And um, you kind of become that gateway. So I, I think that's an easy way to connect with uh, projects, both, you know, through their DAO, making proposals, and also just through doing, like, educational content, like guides and written content, like explainers on the technology. Yeah, I think that's what, where, like, my question comes from. Because me personally, like, and I think why retail trading is getting so big on Robinhood and crypto and stuff is with, like, coronavirus i came from the uh, restaurant industry and like just seeing how my whole industry can just be turned off and just like the lack of job security in one of the strongest quote-unquote strongest industries i thought at the time can just like evaporate like that And i think there's like this huge uh urge to gather new knowledge to become sustainable to join this arising industry but like you said it's so vast and uh, confusing that like it's hard for people to find entry uh position i guess that's kind of like where um just you said like reaching out with protocols you believe in researching and just being there during the growth is the most important you are it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a youtube channel called the bearded professor um and i, I met this guy uh end of last year to you know, do an interview with him about about Bancor. Um, it, he had, uh, he'd made a, a bunch of videos about uh, a project called Empty Sat Dollar, um, which I can't remember if it, if it's a if it was forked by Dynamic Sat Dollar or whatever. But the point is is that it's this, you know it's this interesting stablecoin project, um, algorithmic stablecoin project, and he just got super interested, super into it, uh, made a bunch of educational content, um, was present in the community channels helping out, you know, helping the, the project devs basically field questions and, and educate everyone. And, you know, now he's a, um, he's got a, a community leader, you know, um, position in, in that team now as well. So certainly being involved and being useful seems to be a, a high yielding way to, um, you know, to actually getting, uh, getting on top of these career paths or potential career paths. I had a, uh, I had a question, you know, you talked about, um, you know, Chainlink, uh, another big infrastructure coin that's like pretty popular here in the base space is the graph. So from a uh, protocol perspective and utilizing potentially GRT, could you guys kind of speak on the ports that place for you guys to help execute? Uh, I mean, I'm not going to be able to comment on it very authoritatively. I, I kind of know the, I probably know as, as much as the next person about GRT, but I have not spent a second thinking about how it be integrated into yeah. Bancor. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. I, yeah, my question was, yeah, just kind of generally, you know, how, you know, each of these utility tokens kind of play a part to help everyone execute. Um, and I just wanted to see if you guys, from like your perspective, um, but that makes sense if you don't have an in-depth knowledge on that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, honestly, I'm not going to be able to say anything interesting about it other than um, you're right, obviously, like, it, you know, it, it's a part of the, the growing ecosystem and, the, you know, it's nice to have um, something like GRT, which actually has, you know, default utility in its own network. Um, but yeah, it, it, with regards to what its influence on Bancor is or what, it's, what Bancor's influence on it will be, I really have not, um, I have not dedicated uh, a single uh, moment of, of thought. Or to, to consider it, I'm, I'm sorry to say. 
I, I will say um, on top of our APIs, it'll make develop it, make it easier for developers to plug into our data, which is extremely important for analytics providers and also you know really any interface that uses Paycor. Uh, we've we've invested a lot in building out our own APIs, and the graph is not played as a big role in that, but. You know, I, the graph is being built out for Bancor, and it's becoming more advanced. And it's a it's a widely used resource by DeFi projects to expose their uh, expose their analytics and the you know insides of their system, so that developers can plug plug into their systems more easily. So I don't see any reason why uh, you know the graph wouldn't wouldn't play that role for Bancor too. Um, other than marketing and sales, it seems like. The biggest issue for DEXs in general, I guess, would just be liquid providing liquidity. So, um, and I know that you guys have kind of tailored your incentive structure uh, so that people do provide liquidity. So, at what point do you think, um, maybe generalities, because I know you can't get too specific, but at what point do you foresee the incentive mechanisms start to switch um, more toward the, the BNT holder? Um, yeah, so that's it's a really interesting question. So I, I want to make sure that I understood it correctly. You're asking when should we, uh, at what point should we consider the the VA, like the incentives to provide the the liquidity to be exclusive over TKM? So um, I'm going to make one assumption, and if you might disagree with it, so correct me if you think I'm wrong. But as far as I can tell, basically the way that the DEX market is structured is that uni's on top of course and then you know you guys are like third for market cap but um what like right now you guys are your incentive structure is for liquidity you know so that you can write right. slippage and do all those things that it benefits but it said in the economic analysis that you would um change that in the future um you know because right now it's kind of at the cost of the bnt the bank or uh, holders a little bit so when does that transition start to happen where it's not so much about trying to provide liquidity? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so I, in a way, and, you know, maybe you can correct me if you think I'm, I'm overstepping it here. But it's like, when, when do we shift focus from, um, from building out the infrastructure to actually making it profitable? That is uh, one compartment, uh, component, yes. Yeah, yeah. So I'd say that we've started that already. Um, we've got a, a bunch of um, a bunch of ideas that we're working on. Uh, it's not really clear exactly how you know how to go about it. Um, but did you, did you see that we've got this trading competition coming out with like these um, uh, uh, limited edition NFTs? Yeah, I saw something about that. I didn't go. Look yeah. Much, so there are these kinds of like initiatives where we're we're going to be experimenting with um, how to get traction. Right. It's like. Um, imagine you've just spent all this time building like the, the best, you know, the best restaurant in town or something. Um, and you know, it's the best restaurant in town and everyone that comes to the restaurant really likes you that really likes it, but you're not getting as much, you know, as much, uh, traffic as much, you know, uh, as much, um, as much revenue as like, you know, the Buffalo Wild Wings down the street or something, which is, you know, by the way, an awesome restaurant as well. But whatever. The point is, is that you, you, you think that you've got the best thing and you need to get, you know, customers in. How do you do it? It's like, well, you know, do you have a coupon day? Do you um, buy advertising space on television or on billboards? Um, you know, do you reduce your prices? Do you change the menu? There's all kinds of things that you can do to try and appeal to that that other demographic. And I think that's what, you know, that's what Bancor is wrestling with now is that we've we spent so much time focusing on liquidity providers and what the, the needs are of liquidity providers that we've kind of neglected, um, you know, what drives traders. And, you know, that's not something that we've forgotten about, by the way. It's always been on our mind. It's just that we thought that what traders wanted was deep liquidity pools. Um, and it turns out traders want all kinds of other things. And now we've got to, you know, we are in the process of, of building out the ecosystem to give traders those things that they want. So things like, for example, a bigger selection of tokens to, to trade on. We had a, a conversation earlier on in this conversation about uh, fundamental analysis versus technical analysis. But there are other people that love that technical analysis game. 
and they love to swing trade all kinds of stuff, right? Whatever they want to do. Um, and I think Uniswap has really got the, the market cornered on that because um, it's so convenient to provide liquidity with Ethereum um, and set up shop on, on Uniswap. And so what we're doing now with initiatives like the origin pools and like um, the um, dual liquidity mining and dual environmental loss protection coverage with, with other token projects, we're going to build out this token inventory that means that traders can come to Bancor and, and play the trading games that they want to play. They don't have to go to Uniswap. Um, the other things that we're doing, trying to do is to get you know the gas cost down. This is a part of the architecture upgrade I'm supposed to be working on now, but I'm talking to you guys instead. Um, you know, the, we also know that um, that traders like other things like you know other additional incentives, things like gas rebates or things like you know leaderboards. It's a competition, it's a sport to them. Um, and the more we learn about um, how traders behave and the kind of things that they, they like doing, the more we're going to be able to, to build um, specific, you know, products for that community. We're kind of like Uber, right? We don't have just one demographic of, of users. And, it's um, funny. It, yeah. No, I'm sorry to cut you off. It's just really funny you say that because I was actually thinking, in my mind, I was kind of comparing you not um, in any way based on the way the market but just based on your, uh, what I can tell is your business model, it kind of seems like Amazon-ish, where you are trying to get as much, well, at least that you were, trying to get as much uh, liquidity in your guys' pools as possible. And that was the, the focus. And profit will come later once you have market share in that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Account. No, yeah. And maybe, maybe that was the mistake that we made. Um, I think that we are definitely a shared business platform. So our, our business model is very, very close to something like Airbnb or Uber, where you've got the service providers, which would be the, the people that own the accommodation or own the cars in, uh, in Uber and Airbnb. And then you've got the people wanting to ride those cars, right, driving those cars uh, as passengers or um, hire those, you know, accommodations as, as holiday stays. So in our case, the liquidity providers are kind of like the drivers and the homeowners. And then... Um, the traders are the passengers and and um, holiday letters. So yeah, I, I think where Bancor is it? Yeah, if you, you stretch, if you if you stretch that analogy, I'd say it's close to the Airbnb because if you think about it, you're going to want to go as a the demand to where the sort of best supply is, and in the same way you'd want to go to Airbnb for the best uh, spaces to stay, you'll want to go to the exchange that has the best and highest performing assets. So I think from our perspective, we we do and we have always seen Bancor as a liquidity solution for token projects. And you get the solution for tokens, then you also get the solution for traders as well, because that you are the de facto place to um, purchase these assets and then transfer them into more st more stable and sturdy assets. Does that make sense? Yeah, I appreciate the, the answer, guys. Mark, if I could ask you a question about something you brought up earlier. Um, I'm personally a holder of Uniswap, but something I've realized kind of in this conversation as time goes on, and when you brought up earlier how V2 of Bancor is kind of really V3, so you see some of the possible writing on the wall. Could you elaborate on some of the... I, I realize I've kind of stepped into an echo chamber of Uniswap being the <laughs> the, I, the more you elaborate on these things, I'm realizing uh, I may need to zoom out and look at the possible downsides. Yeah. Uh, could you elaborate on some of the things you may think Uniswap v3 may or troubles other dexes, especially Uniswap, may run into? Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a, will be a success. Um, I spent a lot of time talking to um, to professional market makers over the, the last couple of months, and they kind of fall into two groups. There are guys that are like are like, oh, shit, I really don't want to fucking deal with Uniswap v3. That's going to be way too much effort. We just want to provide liquidity on Bancor. And then there are the other camp, which is providing liquidity on Bancor isn't profitable enough. I'm going to provide, uh, you know, I want to be an active market maker on v3. Um, but I think what the retail side don't realize is that V3 is going to be dominated by these, you know, the A team of market makers, 
right? The people that live for, for pricing algorithms and um, actively managing their position, and they're going to be doing this all the time. So let's talk about how, you know, what V3 means for the, the lazy liquidity provider and, um, and why I think that um, soon retail liquidity providers won't want to actually be participating in the, what V3 allows you to do is to spread your liquidity over whatever um, whatever range of the bonding curve you want, and this is Uniswap's main you know main innovation. It's quite beautiful, actually. I I, I tell people often that I, I wish I had thought of it because um, it's it's just brilliant. Um, but at the same time, I think if I had thought of it, Bancor wouldn't have developed it. Um, and the reason is that it creates this really um, this this super difficult competition between people who know exactly what they're doing and people that think they know what they're doing. So as you spread your liquidity out over the curve, the wider you spread it, the more opportunity someone has to come in with a, a very concentrated liquidity supply over the top of you. So let's imagine you know, Alice, for example, has a hundred dollars in you know in USDC and she spreads that hundred dollars over the whole curve, so zero to infinity. And then Bob has a hundred dollars in USDC. But he spreads it just over the you know whatever price point he thinks that 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 thing is going to be traded at. Let's say it's, it's over Ethereum. Bob, if he's concentrating his liquidity at like you know at 100 times um, you know a higher amount than Alice is, or you know in this case it's nearly infinite, but let's just say it's 100 times, um, then he's collecting you know 99 percent of the fees. So just because Alice is participating in the pool doesn't necessarily mean she's getting any of the revenue. And so the lazy liquidity providers who are going to trying to, you know, not get completely demolished by a permanent loss. And this is one of the other things that, um, that I think doesn't get talked about enough is that when you, when you amplify the liquidity, when you concentrate the liquidity, you also concentrate the impermanent loss. Um, it's very much a leveraged liquidity position. Um, so if there's, you know, if you're concentrated, uh, you know, a hundred times, and the price moves by 1%, you're selling all of your Ethereum for USDC and getting ejected from the pool. And I don't think that's what anyone wants. Um, so the, but the market makers that are going to be, um, you know, competing with the, um, the retail LPs for, for these kinds of things, they don't mind getting wiped out because they're only ever contributing, you know, $100,000 of their $1 million in capital that they have set aside to participate on D3. So when they get, you know, when they get completely wiped out with their 100k of Ethereum for USDC, they've got another 900k that they're going to be, um, you know, pulling out of their pocket to, to get back into V3 to keep competing with. Whereas I think with liquidity uh, providers on Uniswap, they're used to putting like most of their capital or you know most of their holdings um, into um, a single like Uniswap V2 sort of pool. If you do that on V3, it's very likely that it's just going to get. Um, you know, transformed into the other asset and you're just going to get ejected. And if you don't want that to happen, you have to spread your liquidity out very thin, which means you're getting zero fees because the market makers are so concentrated over the top of you. So it's really like, it's a very, very competitive game. We're going to see like, you know, I think Uniswap V3, it could almost become a spectator spot, you know, where we get to watch market makers compete with each other to see, you know, how good they are at pricing things, um, how concentrated they can get the the, the liquidity to be. And if you have a full-time job, you don't have time to do that. Um, you know, it, it's risky and you need to constantly be moving your funds in and out. Uh, it's just going to be a nightmare for, for regular people to do this. And it was designed not with regular people in mind. Right? It was designed to allow professionals to do what they do on order books with, um, with Ethereum. So yeah, Uniswap V3 should be, for all intents and purposes, considered a, uh, a professional fintech product. It is a, um, a better way of doing audible making that is effectively decentralized and probably, you know, regulation resistant, at least for now. I think that they're probably, now that there's going to be so few people using Uniswap, I think that it will start to come under the purview of regulators a lot more than it has. But whatever. It's, it's a, it's a terrific invention. Um, but for normal people, it's completely unusable. Yeah, I think um, I think that's a big mi misconception. Uh, a conception that there will be some sort of like automated solution that can potentially be plugged into that to make it okay for uh, passive liquidity providers or lazy liquidity providers. And actually, Mark, I'd love for you to just chime in and talk about this is kind of what we built with V2, Bancor V2. Yeah. So yeah, and that's so what Bancor. Go ahead. 
sorry, no, yeah, okay. So the Bankrupt version 2 was an automated version of Uniswap v3. Um, it's just that instead of having, you know, I think I mentioned this in the call already, I can't remember if I did. Instead of having bins and everything, uh, we just used dynamic weights. So as the price moved around, we used a chain link oracle to um, change the, the weights. Um, and this, one, it, it avoided impermanent loss, or was supposed to avoid impermanent loss. And two, it meant that you were always providing liquidity at exactly the price point that the market wanted it at. Um, and so this is, you know, a, I'm not making an argument necessarily as to whether or not Bancor's um, solution to um, liquidity um, concentration was better than Uniswap's. I think actually probably Uniswap's is more interesting, I, or at least I prefer it. The dynamic weights one is is still good. It's just, you know, it's maybe a bit, um, you, you lose some features with the dynamic weights that you actually gain with Uniswap's pins. Um, but whatever, the, uh, the overall concept is the same. You, you want an automated way to use the, the capital that you have to concentrate it at exactly the price point that the market is trading at. And that means that you can, you know, you can take a thousand dollars and make it perform like a million dollar pool and everyone's happy. The problem is, is that as soon as you start automating it, it becomes exploitable. Um, I, it's like, yeah, I, okay, again, I feel like I said this earlier in the call, but it's been such a long call, I can't remember what I said. Um, it's like playing chess when you have to reveal your moves to your opponent ahead of time. That's what automation does in DEXs. It's not because, you know, v, V2 for Bancor didn't fail because Chainlink was a bad oracle at all. It failed because it is limited by time resolution, right? Chainlink can't predict the future yet. <laughs> um, it delivers you information as it happens. So there's a slight lag, but even then it's going to get faster. But that doesn't matter because the front runners and uh, Ethereum miners know the future. Um, and anything that is going to be used to, um, to try and automate Uniswap v3 will be exploited in exactly the same way as that, that Bancor v2 was exploited. So it really is going to be a professional game, and I don't ever see it getting automated. Mark, that changes that. the relate. Good. Hey, well, it's it's slightly on this topic. Um, sure. I, I don't have the technical expertise to, so I may be phrasing this question wrong. Uh, is is Bancor is it compatible to execute in uh, trusted execution environments like you know the TEs and the Town Crier? It's a really good question. Do you know the answer to that? I actually don't. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. Can you expand on what you're referring to there? Yeah. So I know um, you know Chainlink has some solutions out there to where they're they're planning on you know having uh, Town Crier in these trusted execution environments to where applications can basically execute within a protected environment that they, I think they call them like enclaves. Um, and I just was curious, you know, generally speaking, uh, from a cap, uh, compatibility perspective, um, is there any application that could be used? And I just didn't know if, uh, Bancor was. Yeah, it's a really good question. I need to, I need to spend some time thinking about it. Um, I think that, <sighs> I mean, the, sh the short answer is why not, I think. Um, but the, the longer answer is that, you know, I, I would need to look at exactly how these trusted environments operate and whether or not there is still a financial incentive for someone to do something, um, you know, to do something that, that, that hurts someone else. I think that's what it generally comes down to. But yeah, I need, to, I need to spend some time thinking about it. <clears throat> Um, I think that's probably a good answer. What do you think? I mean, my experience. Unless we have any more questions from the audience. Um, Indigo has been requesting for some time to join, so maybe we'll let him in really quick and then close it out there. Cool. Sure. Yeah, while we're waiting to join, I just want to appreciate uh, Mark's perspective on the Uniswap thing because something I've noticed a lot on this crypto Twitter space of Uniswap investors of kind of like they're essentially overhyping V3 because retail's getting essentially like the spectator support analysis. We're getting kind of kicked out here. Um, like yeah. I guess if you're essentially only a token holder and you're just just bullish on the value of one Uniswap token, I guess that's fine. But 
I, I, it's just kind of astonishing to me that people are reading this V3 white paper and are like still semi excited because like retail is kind of not allowed. Yeah, I think people are kind of excited about it. This is again coming back to the, um, the reason why I decided to um, not, not be a part of the Kylo ecosystem anymore is that the people that are really in. You know, are really excited for V3, they're not liquidity providers, I, I think. I think they're just uni token holders. 100%. Hey, Indigo, did you have a, did you have a question for Mark and Nate? Yeah, yeah, I did, actually. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I, I recently found out about Bancor maybe like a month ago, and um, honestly, the I'm a dev myself um, working on a crypto project, and I saw the way you guys did your 2.1 tokenomics model, and I'm just surprised that, like, I've never seen a model like that. And in fact, I see a lot of copycats by like HydraDX and uh, a few other right. protocols. I've been very curious, like, what was the thought process? Like, it's just amazing how what that model was capable of. Like, what was the process that made you guys come up with that? I think Nate's going to have to take this one because he was there for the genesis of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, really, the guy who, who built it is the guy who <clears throat> created the first AMMs on uh, Ethereum. And he's not on this call. His name is Eyal Herzog. And he's uh, the co-founder of Bancor and head of research. And so I can't really speak for him, but I, I, I can just... It was actually a... You know, like there's what Mark was saying with V2, when we realized that liquidity amplification sort of needed some, you know, needed some tweaks or was not possible in the format that we, we thought, we just stayed steadfast on solving this issue of impermanent loss and how that could be possibly solved. And BNT, in its, when, it, when it started, was a, an elastic supply token. And so I think we were comfortable kind of considering that the change to the, uh, change to the network could somehow unlock this feature of uh, impermanent loss protection. Um, and then it was just kind of the, I think, bingo moment that the protocol can also generate its own fees and, burn, you know, control the burning of own tokens that, that it could unlock that feature. So I can't speak for, from, a, from a dev's perspective, uh, you know, Ayal is the research, but, you know, I can say that Mark and Ayal are now working, and that was before Mark arrived, and now to see them sort of work together, we have these two just, like, research powerhouses um, that, uh, yeah, that I think uh, can really sort of take that take that model forward. I will add that I think VBNT and Vortex sort of came about uh, somewhat as a surprise, I will say, honestly. Um, I remember we were on a call and, you know, y'all was mentioning how it's interesting to actually sell your BBNT. And, and then I think once we dug in, so, you know, it, it wasn't in some ways it was a, a grand plan, but in other ways, I think we stumbled upon some amazingly powerful parts of it. That, uh, your question, Indigo? Yeah. Um, can I ask one more? Yeah, go for it. All right. Uh, you guys keep hinting at new features. I don't know how much you can reveal, but I'd love to hear anything if you're allowed to. Yeah, I mean, I can. I feel comfortable saying that we are also really focused on capital efficiency and uh, concentrated liquidity. And we feel like we figured out a way to do that without sacrificing sort of usability by uh, passive LPs. So continuing to sort of solve that uh, use case, I think at the end of the day, which some of you guys have um, talked about, is like the relationship between a token community and the holders doing the market making for the token project feels a lot more natural than hiring a professional active algorithmic trading firm to do your market making who might necess who might not even have any exposure or you hold in the tokens and most of these active trading firms don't really take long positions so it's like who do you want um 
who do you want providing that service? And like, what makes more sense in certain, in terms of like incentive alignment? Um, I don't know, Mark, do you want to go on out? After capital efficiency, what did you say? Sorry, just real quick. Um, so after capital efficiency, also talking about this concept of uh, con concentrated liquidity and how you can sort of amplify that uh, and amplify liquidity, um, you know, during, uh, using uh, me mechanisms that are accessible to kind of passive LPs and you don't need to constantly be making updates to your stake. It continues to be a sort of set and, and forget solution but the pool can also concentrate liquidity uh, around, you know, an optimal price point. Yeah, and so I'd say, you know, it's also, you don't have to squint too hard to see what the what the problems with Banco's ecosystem already are. Um, and so obviously we're aware of what those problems are. So any of the grievances that you've had, um, you know, from the, from the community before, including and especially gas prices, um, and, you know, other things that, that you would want um, to have available to you as a liquidity provider on Bancor um, that isn't currently available, obviously all of that is gonna be um, a part of the next release. Um, I think we'll wrap it up there, guys, to be honest. I, Mark, Nate, everyone, 100 spam in the, in the chat, like really, <clears throat> them taking their time to come on and speak to the base space. I mean, this was this was so based. <laughs> it was a super lit. Base. So much <laughs> was dropped in this chat. So really, really blessed to have them come on and just appreciate you taking like three hours of your time to, to speak to the community. I think we everyone learned a ton. <clears throat> Real quick, dude. awesome. Hey, sure, man. Appreciate y'all for um, accepting a message from a, a, a frog avatar. <laughs> Um, you know, <laughs> hitting you up in DMs, spamming you. Uh, I really appreciate it. You know, uh, I, I yeah. one here definitely, definitely took a lot of information from this, and um, yeah, it was really insightful. So thank well, you. Glad to have you guys. We do record these. Are you guys okay with us using uh, any of this audio to like re-upload to our channel? Yeah. Awesome. Appreciate you guys so much. Yeah, we love all these questions, so we, you know, I would rather uh, spend three hours of my uh, waking morning doing anything else. So thank you, uh, thanks for having us. These, you guys had some awesome questions and a really good insight on uh, on, on all the shit. Absolutely, thank you guys. Let's do it again. Some, let's do it again sometime. Oh yeah, for sure. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Hey, when that new white paper comes out. Yeah, when the new white paper. <laughs> we'll have a party in here. Link will probably be in the hundred. We'll send it right your after. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, right. Thank you, you so much. Thank you guys so much. Thanks guys.